I'm Elizabeth Hudson. I'm the Dean of the Northeastern College of Arts, Media, and Design. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this morning in recognition of Black Mountain College and the artistic legacy that it's given us all. I hope you all have been or are going to the remarkable exhibit at the ICA, Leap Before You Look, Black Mountain College, 1933 to 1957, which really illustrates the diverse forms of artistic expression that were at the very core of its educational mission. As all of us here know, contemporary art would not be what it is today without Black Mountain College and the permission its students were given to explore and experiment across disciplines free of consequences. Black Mountain College fostered extreme experimentation through creativity and inter interdisciplinary coordination. It was a haven for people who wanted the freedom to think and to live in a different way. The work of its faculty and students revolutionized the arts and sciences in the second half of the 20th century and inspired many of us to be who we are today. I'm particularly proud that the Northeastern College of Arts, Media, and Design is hosting this symposium today because we take this legacy as both an inspiration and a challenge for the way we shape artistic pedagogy now and in the future. It's therefore my great honor to share this moment in time with you and to introduce you to Bree Edwards, the director for the Center of the Arts at Northeastern University and a driving force behind this outstanding symposium. Thank you. Wow, good morning. It is fabulous to see you all here. We have some more chairs we can get for the people in the back. Um, but fill in the tables. There's room up front. If you have room at your table, hold your hand up so people can come see where to sit down. And please feel free to move around while I'm talking. Um, good morning. Today's symposium would not have been possible without the support of the Department of Art and Design, the, the support of Chair Nathan Feld and um, Dean Hudson. Today's symposium has been thoughtfully crafted and curated by Gloria Sutton and Jenny Sorkin. Brilliant scholars who are engaged in the histories of Black Mountain College in such unique ways that it has been a true pleasure for me to work with them over the past year. I also wanted to thank the ICA for inviting Northeastern and Northeastern Center for the Arts to contribute to the scholarship around Black Mountain College. A generous and ambitious decision um, to extend the exhibition out into the city of Boston and into higher education. Um, I, um, I also wanted to thank from the ICA Helen Molesworth for extending this invitation to Gloria and I to contribute um, what has resulted in the symposium today, to Ruth Erickson and Eva Respini, who hosted beautiful tour and conversation last night with Sarah Vanderbeek, where they spoke of family, community, collaboration, and artistic influence, all themes which will continue um, through the panels and, and presentations today. I also wanted to thank Monica Garza for being a wonderful collaborator, and I hope that this is a model of collaboration that will continue between the ICA and higher ed institutions such as Northeastern. My sincere thanks also goes to my team, Joe and Thomas Van Adder, for really making um, a lot happen here today, and to each of you for being with us. Um, I had the pleasure of working at the Asheville Art Museum from 2004 to 2006 and visit the site of Black Mountain College. It was while I was um, director of exhibitions and public programs at the Asheville Art Museum that I began to explore the legacies of Black Mountain College for arts, pedagogy and artistic practice. And it is a true pleasure to see where that um, thinking has gone. And I'm really looking forward to each of the presenters today. Um, so the structure for the today, you have a, hopefully you all have a brochure, a, a program in front of you. We have decided for the sake of time to um, not engage in lengthy introductions on all of our brilliant and accomplished presenters. Their bios are in front of you, um, so I encourage you to take a look at that. We will have two sessions in the morning. We'll break for lunch, and we are providing lunch. Hopefully there's enough for everyone. If not, there's restaurants nearby. And um, we will convene in the afternoon for two more sessions. We will plan to conclude at 3 o'clock. 
Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I wanted to tell you that the restrooms are located behind the stage on this side. So you'll just go down this path if you have to use them. There is Wi-Fi in this building, um, which would be NU-Wave or NU-Wave Guest. With NU-Wave Guest, you just have to log on like you're on an airplane um, and you should be able to use it. And um, without further ado, I would like to introduce my esteemed colleague and one of the co-curators um, of today's symposium, Gloria Sutton. Thank you. Welcome everybody, and again, if you are just coming in, there are a few seats down here. One, I wanted to thank, not, you know, it's nice to have a collaborator like Bree, she does all of the official thanking for me. I just wanted to also extend a thank you to my colleagues and my students out there, um, and also my colleagues in the room who've um, joined me on this little bit of an, of an experiment in what a symposium related to an experimental pedagogical model could be. So one of the reasons why you're sitting at these tables is that the idea is that we wanted to kind of think about um, conversation as the driving force. So as Bree said, we're not doing lengthy introductions. We're also trying to um, really take advantage of everybody that's in this room because we realize that there are many people in the room that we want to hear equally from this morning as well. Um, one of the points that I wanted to think about was when we have this opportunity to think through the prompt of the exhibition is to think about different models of curation and scholarship and artistic practice, bringing scholars and artists together and developing a collaborative model for research. So while the exhibition is definitely one prompt, one of the other prompts was this book that, I, that just was published by MIT Press in 2015. Um, called The Experience Machine. And so, in many ways, if an exhibition is a four-year project, um, an academic or scholarly tome is probably a decade in the making. We work on a glacial pace, and so one of the things that I'm happy to do is have a quick set of conversations <laughs> rather than this in-depth thing. But part of it was also thinking through in the ways that research and creative research is manifest. One of the things that I always talk to my students about is to think about scholarship as an active practice that manifests in things like like exhibitions and books. But that is because our tool is scholarly research and primary research. So basically curators and my colleagues today, the historians, the curators, and the artists themselves are engaged in a process in which we pay, take basic forms like oral histories and we have to interpret material residues and artifacts. So in my own work, this meant approaching someone like Johanna Vanderbeek, who is an extraordinary resource and happy to have her in the room today. And this is a slide from her, at her um, outside of her studio in Amagansett in 2006. This is what her storage facility looked like around that time. So before there was any semblance of an estate, before there's any semblance of an archive, what we do in our fields, the curators themselves, the studio visits, being on the ground, the kind of archival research and, and, and oral history taking, is the tools and methodologies that we engage in. Working within an art and design department within a college of art, media, and design, I want to argue that my scholarship in this symposium is analogous to the ways that creative research has developed in the field, and it exemplifies the type of interdisciplinary work that comes out of a college that positions the arts at the center of its focus, which resounds with Black Mountain. So today, the, art, the conversation you know, is on shorter presentations rather than lengthy papers. And really, we, we really want to think about this idea of conversations as a tool um, in what we do. And that was one of the interests in the prompt for the symposium is to really take not necessarily retreading the history of the college, which I think the exhibition at the ICA does so remarkably well. The prompt we took was to actually say, what happens after? What are some of the residual and resounding effects of not not only the college's history, but the ethos that it puts into place. And so for me, that meant, again, thinking about my own research was to think about something like intentional communities that come out of Black Mountain College when the college, the, the dissolution of the college happens in 1957, and thinking about text or ideas of that period, a sort of social psychological approach to thinking about living and working as espoused by this book, Communitas, that was published in 1947 by the architect Percival Goodman and his brother, Black Mountain College creative writing faculty member, Paul Goodman. 
So he, the idea that we make our own intentional communities and that, that role of community is a resounding theme of this symposium today. And it reflects the book's edict for people to be, quote, agents of their own needs and to create the spaces that would engender the type of lives they wanted to, to lead. Um, and then again, one of the other ethos or kind of aphorisms of this period from Black Mountain and Communitas was to get people to improve what they have. So this also meant to think about in a very short time, sorry, um, this chart that, that Charles um, Olson has for us is that Jenny and I wanted to think about looking outward, how in a very short span of time the ethos of Black Mountain College continued to influence practice going forward. That became a springboard to think about the effects on contemporary practice, artistic, curatorial, and scholarly. We wanted to examine the larger networks, so that's one of the reasons why you'll see these themes, lost and found, translation, production, and participation this morning with an artist, Sarah Vanderbeek, and Anne Elgood, curator at the Hammer Museum, in which the exhibition will move to. And I wanted to think through what does the context change from, from Boston to, to Los Angeles do in for, in for these questions. And then later, the experiential art and performance of life with Jim Voorhees, Carol Stakanis, and Ruth Erickson to think about curation and audience building as another kind of resounding effect from Black Mountain. So again, thinking about how research and audiences work, one of the questions that came up for me was not just to think about the objects and histories, but the different art worlds and the different discourses that ally and come together under Black Mountain. So in this kind of slide, you see Andy Warhol in the back of Stan Vanderbeek. You see a stalwart film scholar like Annette Michelson on the right-hand side, and Ken Dewey, and this cacophonous scene of children living and working around Gate Hill Co-op in where the movie drone was cited. So again, it's not just the histories, but the discourses and his audiences um, and disciplines that come and converge. One of the other challenges I had in thinking about this material was also thinking about the way that projected images and new technologies were advanced and experimented with artists, another kind of resounding theme from Black Mountain College. How to make sense of image, imagery that's malleable, projected, morphed, and, and serial. Not only the images themselves, but the expectations for audiences change and also affect contemporary practices now, so that artists are directing new expectations or the idea of a normative model of an audience has rapidly changed. For me, also, it was a challenge to think about, again, how to make sense of an artist's practice in which images are inherently reproducible and malleable and serial. How do we make sense of assemblage and collage, new techniques that happen within moving image work in particular? And this is where I learned an important lesson from my colleague Jennifer Sor Jenny Sorkin. And one of the things that um, I have keen interest in thinking about as a scholar of contemporary art and new media, I'm constantly being asked, how does it make sense to be a historian of something that is tethered to the new and the now? And that's what my response usually is, is because everything new and now links back to earlier models and histories. And an important lesson for me in Black Mountain and in Stan Vanderbeek's own work is the role of somebody like Mary Carolyn Richards, who is a poet, a potter, and a translator for this group of avant-garde men in the post-war period. So taking the lessons from her manuals and treatises on pottery and shaping not only ceramics, but I would argue time and duration, her ideas of collage and making and taking and reshaping. And the overlapping Venn diagram between ceramics, craft, and media would be Black Mountain College, and that was an important locus for us, where, Mary, where MC Richards was a faculty member there, a translator, an, ins an inspired teacher for this group of mostly men. Um, of course, there was Albers, thinking about Cunningham and choreography, but more importantly for me, the notation and thinking about how to conceptualize space and time and movement. Annie Albers' weaving techniques would be a constant metaphor for um, images and thinking about editing and the process of building something by hand. And of course, the spatial configurations and experiments of someone like Buckminster Fuller, who also probably offered us all as artists and scholars some important lessons around the generative process of failure. But if I have one revisionist fantasy or goal in this symposium and any of the after sort of effects of this new scholarship that will hopefully be inspired by you, the students in the room who take up Black Mountain and the questions that it asks, one of the resounding fantasies that I hold is this idea that what if 
we took MC Richards and thought of her as the centrifugal force, not John Cage, nothing against Cage, but if we stopped looking at Cage as being the kind of force and looked at MC as the way in which this centrifugal force around which all of these other avant-garde and experimental practices figured, what would those new narratives generate? What would that look like? And I'll just close and say, again, thinking about the role of pedagogy in art in the current moment, I turn back to Vanderbeek's prolific writing, and he's um, one of the interesting things about him, I think, for me, too, is to think about how artists are putting their own methodologies and pedagogies on the table for us. We don't necessarily have to go outside. They offer us, within visual art, models and methods of our own understanding and mining. And in 1982, shortly before his death, he writes an article on media art and pedagogy, which he outlined his ideal arts program as a type of corrective one that would, quote, stress research as well as performance, where past artistic achievements and future utilizations of technology would be examined so that students create ideas to change the cultural environment. So I think that's sort of the charge today. I'm looking forward for the set of conversations. That's one of the reasons we're sort of sitting in this round table environment. We encourage you, hopefully, to be inspired, to ask questions, and to continue that conversation after this afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. I look forward to hearing from you. So again, I'm, um, it's killing me not to give the two people and many of the others that I respect deeply, one of the, the real privileges of being able to organize this is to invite the, the people that I want to hear and learn from the most. These are two of them, Ann Elgood here and Sarah Vanderbeek, who will start us off out in the morning. Thanks, Gloria. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay so I don't have to like bring it closer. Um, I just want to thank, first of all, Gloria and Jenny and Bree for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here, and I um, was thrilled to see the show last night, and um, even more thrilled that it will be coming to Los Angeles to the Hammer. So um, I'm going to read for the first few minutes, and forgive me for that, um, but I just wanted to get some thoughts out, and then I'm going to turn to some images, let me see. That's a little teaser. I'll go back. Um, and then I'm going to turn to a couple of exhibitions and, and talk about them for, for different reasons. And um, I'm going to throw out a lot of different ideas and perhaps provocations that I hope we can come back to in some of the conversations that happened today. So much of my uh, presentation today will, pra will focus on curatorial practice as a site of translation, production, and participation, focusing on two exhibitions. One, a traveling exhibition that I did not curate, but for which I served as the in-house curator and installed at the Hammer. And the other, a historical exhibition that I co-organized with a colleague for the Hammer. But before I turn to my own practice, I want to say a few words about why the Hammer signed on to take Callan's Black Mountain College exhibition. As a museum associated with the university, we felt that an exhibition examining a history that is not only characterized by the objects and events that were created during that time, but by a pedagogical philosophy and its influences on American culture would be particularly meaningful for our audiences, including, of course, the students and faculty at UCLA. We see the hammer as a site for pedagogy, one often committed to presenting historical figures who have been overlooked to some degree, and certainly the Black Mountain College show goes to some effort to um, reveal some of the lesser known artists within the trajectory of many, many well-known artists. We also think of ourselves as a community center, and although that may sound passe to some, I think it's really at the core of our mission. And we think of ourselves as a hub of activity that we hope people will return to again and again. Our decision in 2014 to remove the obstacle of an admission fee is one tangible way that we hope to encourage active visitors. Another way this manifests is through our robust public programs that take up a truly diverse range of subjects, thinkers, and formats. And again, Black Mountain College lends itself, of course, to many, many possible public programs and performances. Uh, we currently do about 250 public programs a year at the Hammer, and that is not including presentations of time-based works that are coming out of our curatorial department or our educational programs for children. 
The ethos of Black Mountain College to create critical thinkers and informed citizens for a democracy also resonates with the hammer. In fact, we recently revised our mission statement to be more transparent about what we have always known to be at the core of what we do and who we are, but that we had not previously stated in such a direct and public way, the idea that art has the capacity to create change. And we went through a very lengthy process of rewriting our mission statement, something that can be actually kind of painful, I have to admit. Um, but one of the goals was to really you know, narrow it down. We had this very long mission statement, which we realized, A, nobody's going to read, um, and B, it wasn't getting at the heart of what we really feel is who we are. So it's now one sentence, and I'm going to read it. <laughs> The Hammer Museum at UCLA believes in the power of art and ideas to illuminate our lives and build a more just world. And I feel really proud to work at an arts institution that has collectively embraced the idea of justice. And for me, this is intimately linked to creating a space not only for art, but for ideas and for dialogue, all of which may take unexpected forms that have the potential to surprise our visitors. We also felt that Black Mountain College simply must come to Los Angeles, the exhibition. LA is noteworthy for its incredible array of esteemed art schools, some of which are known for their allegiance to pedagogical methodologies developed at Black Mountain College, like the so-called CRIT. It's also the site of recent upheavals at USC in particular, generating many discussions about the viability of art schools in a shifting educational and fiscal climate, especially those within larger institutions that have proven to not understand their value. To examine a mid-20th century experimental college that put art at the core of its curriculum within this context, as well as the recent debates about the so-called professionalization of artists, feels extremely timely. That said, I'm interested in how the exhibition might provoke conversations not about tuition costs and whether MFA programs are still viable for young artists, but about experimental forms of pedagogy and thinking through past, present, and potentially future models. In terms of my own exhibition practice, I always try to think through not only the subjects within the exhibition as they are argued by the artists and their specific objects, although of course this is critical, but I also try to enter the process of an exhibition's development self-consciously aware of the specific curatorial methodology, methodological questions the project poses. In other words, part of my working process is ruminating on the, established, on the established conventions for the type of show I'm working on, be it a group show of recent work, um, a medium-specific show, a biennial, or a historic group exhibition and how I might embrace aspects of those approaches while being critical of others and hopefully offering alternatives. This has meant that at times I have chosen to develop and stage exhibitions that have been a type of methodology that I had previously sworn off um, or certainly have been skeptical of. In particular, um, I think of a show that I did that was a, or a couple of shows I did are, that were medium specific. I was always very skeptical about this idea of like painting now that type of show. Many of my group exhibitions in particular I would describe as unfolding through the Black Mountain College principle of learning by doing. The evolution of an idea into a form that is perhaps vastly different from what I imagined when I set out on the journey of creating the exhibition, or perhaps more to the point, starting out not with a predetermined idea but with a core group of artists, is perhaps the space where curatorial practice aligns most closely with artistic practice. For me, being open to this process is crucial, not only because I have recognized that over time the exhibition inevitably gains more insights, more nuance, more complexity, and I hope I gain a higher level of comfort with risk taking, but also because this is the space of exhibition making in which I find the most joy and pleasure. Being open and responsive does not, however, mean writing roughshod over the artist's intentions or exerting an arbitrary argument onto a group of objects. Rather, it's a process of doing research, engaging deeply with individual objects, as well as the ideas and arguments that serve as their context, and being in conversation with artists, trusting that my growing understanding will lead the way. Ultimately, the process is one that balances intuition and scholarship, a clear position or argument with a space for dialogue and inquiry, and a sense of enthusiasm and conviction with a certain level of uncertainty and anxiety about the outcome. So now I'm going to turn to a Richard Archwager exhibition. It's a retrospective that was organized by Jennifer Gross for the Whitney Museum, and we brought it to the hammer. 
And this is an image of how one gallery of how it was installed at the Whitney. And what I'm interested in here is the idea of translation, the, the thinking through how an exhibition is in fact translated from one venue to another um, when it goes on tour. And the role of the in-house curator as the exhibition travels, which is actually quite distinct from that of the originating curator whose exhibition it is. So if any of you, and I'm sure many of you, have seen the same exhibition at more than one venue, you know that it can look decidedly different from one museum to the next. This is typically attributed to the architecture of the museum and the inevitable spatial differences of the galleries. And while this is certainly true, one thing that's not always acknowledged, or at times I think probably not even welcomed, is how subsequent venues of an exhibition's tour might choose to rethink the design and installation to highlight specific aspects of an artist's work or to tell the story of that artist through a slightly different lens. Now, I'm not suggesting, I just want to give a little caveat, that as an exhibition travels, um, that any changes that you make aren't with the blessing of the originating curator. I don't advocate ripping an exhibition out from underneath its curator. I'm actually very respectful of the originating curator. But I am arguing for thinking through possibilities for an exhibition and not just sort of um, rotely representing it in, in the way that you think reflects the original installation. And in fact, being in conversation with that original curator um, with your ideas and, and coming to some decisions. Um, welcoming this type of translation may not only complicate or elucidate aspects of the artist's work, but it also serves to underscore how the curatorial process and the installation process in particular is itself a context, a platform, and a site of interpretation, not a group neutral ground or a so-called white cube. So against the white cube, here you have the first gallery of the hammer installation. So, um, I'll try to be relatively brief about this, but what our thinking was, I, I had seen the show at the Whitney actually three different times, and um, what I recognized with it was that Jennifer, as an art historian, was really making an art historical argument um, about this artist and um, you know, his impact within the American landscape and also um, for the most part, the show was installed chronologically and um, so unfolded in what I would say was a fairly conventional art historical way. Now, I think that's, that it, arguably this was the way to do it at the Whitney. Um, it was the first venue, it, it was really Jennifer's installation, um, and it, it made a kind of argument that I think needed to be made. When it came to LA, I wasn't interested in, in replicating that. I really felt like um, there were other ways to look at Art Schwager and to maybe um, think about some of the aspects of his work in, in, in a different sort of environment. So the first thing that I felt at the Whitney was, um, as you can see here, the only kind of um, intervention they made into the space was different gradations of gray on the wall. Um, and the thing about Art Schwager, of course, is that while much of the work is, is muted to a certain degree, there is this incredible color that comes out of um, linoleum and found, you know, found elements that are in the culture. Um, and we really wanted to, in some sense, uh, respond to that and also create a space where, in a sort of a dumb way of putting it, some of the weirdness of Art Schwager's work was highlighted more. I felt that um, at the Whitney, that weirdness, and really he is a very strange artist, <laughs> or he was, um, some of his objects are truly um, uh, hard to understand in some way, and that's what I actually love about him. The fact that they aren't that legible. Art Schwager's a figure who they could never figure out where to put him. Is he a pop artist? Is he a minimalist? Is he, you know, an appropriationist? Um, and is he a painter? Is he a sculptor? And of course he's all of those things, and maybe none of those things. And how do, how do we come to a place where we can think about that a little bit more? So I hired a, a designer who's a colorist, um, and he came back to me with this kind of crazy sense of what to do with the color. So he pulled colors out of the work itself, toned them up or toned them down, and we used colored walls throughout the exhibition. Not in every gallery, there were some white walls, there were some gray walls, we used some of the gray that the Whitney used. But we really, um, I think, 
took some risk in, in some of the choices that we made. This was the first gallery that you entered. Uh, at the Whitney, when you entered the show, you immediately came across the very first works, um, early, early landscapes. I also didn't want to do a chronological hang, hang exactly. I mean, there were some elements of the, of the hang that were chronological, but we also kind of mixed it up. And, and I'll get to the, a little bit more about that later. But in an effort to think about um, uh, the way that Archwager returned throughout his career to certain ideas. He didn't sort of work through an idea and set it aside and move on. He, he would return to things, certain subjects, certain um, ways of working repeatedly throughout the course of his career. So we start the exhibition with um, these three, probably the most iconic Archwager works, as a way of saying, you probably know these particular works. You remember the, the tables, you might know um, the exclamation points, for example. But, but what you're going to see as you continue through the exhibition is a lot of work you're probably less familiar with. Um, these are huge images, so I'm sorry, it's maybe a little pokey. This is the next gallery that you can't see and I can see. Um, we'll see if it comes up. Maybe not. Ah. So uh, yellow walls, this is an, um, one of the presentations of archival material in the exhibition and I'm just showing you the, this, the door as you walk in and then um, a sense of how the space itself looked with the yellow walls. Um, oh wait. I think it skipped my favorite one. I'll see if it shows up later. Um, this is one of the last galleries as, as you're going through the show. And what we did here was included the earliest landscapes by Archwager and then the, the most recent work on paper, also landscapes by him, as this way of actually showing the full trajectory of his work. Um, and as I was describing before, sort of circling back to the idea that, that he had worked through certain ideas repeatedly. Now I can't even see. Okay. Well, I'm gonna see if this, my favorite room's not showing. Um, the green room, excellent. So now I can't see anything on my laptop, but um, you can see. So this was, I mean, I think you, as you entered into this room, you really felt this sense of um, the kind of awkward proportions, the, the skewed perspective, the, the strangeness, as I described, um, of Archwager, and it was really highlighted through this. I think some would maybe argue that it was a little bit, um, perhaps our approach to this was a little heavy-handed, <laughs> um, maybe too much, but I do feel like it gave the show a kind of energy and a liveliness that, that for me was lost in, in the Whitney installation. And so it, it, for me it felt really good. And it felt like a way to um, acknowledge that, that, that sometimes you can take some risks in, in how you install things. These aren't, you know, revolutionary, but even just working with color in interesting ways will reveal certain things. And, and it was nice because Jennifer Gross actually really loved the installation. She called it the LA version of the show, which I think maybe was an insult, um, but, uh, but there was some way in which she, she actually really enjoyed it and really welcomed it, and it was a nice collaboration that we had. So now turning to um, an exhibition I co-organized with Johanna Burton called Take It or Leave It, Institution, Image, Ideology. And this is a show that focused on the intersection of appropriation and institutional critique in American art, and it included 36 uh, American artists who came to prominence in the, the, between the 1970s and the 1990s. And I wanted to talk about this exhibition, and there's much to say about it, and I obviously won't go into um, too much detail, but I thought it would be interesting to talk about historical exhibitions as a methodology. And um, of course, Black Mountain College is a historical show, and having only seen the show for the first time yesterday, uh, I, I have many thoughts already, but um, I'm not going to, I didn't want to try to take that on in terms of the sort of choices that Helen made around this, but I can talk about this show 
in terms of, and you'll recognize some of the artists, I'm, I don't have um, captions, I apologize for that. But when we thought about the fact that this was a historical show, albeit one of a recent history, focused mostly on work from the 80s and 90s, um, we actually made a decision fairly early on about how we would uh, choose work for the checklist. So while we were choosing work by the various artists from this time period, we also decided to include recent work. And we did this to acknowledge that the show uh, consisted of primarily, and I'm just gonna, these might start going forward on their own, and if not, I'll just scroll through. Um, I'm not gonna talk about specific images, but just let you see a bit of how the show looked. Um, but we wanted to recognize that the artists were still, in many, most cases, alive and working, and that they had made a sustained commitment, both historically um, and in emerging strategies, to appropriation and institutional critique, and that it was important for us not to treat the artists like they were sort of past their prime. In other words, like they had made their best work in the 80s and 90s, and what they were doing today wasn't as relevant. It was also an acknowledgement that, for us, these artists' practices were really cumulative. It was about um, a commitment to ideas over time, not about a particular work or a sort of iconic work within their um, trajectory. Uh, we also wanted to avoid what Barbara Kruger has called decadism, uh, the framing of uh, activities into convenient time periods, and what Hal Foster has described as historicism's totalizing of time and adherence to continuity by acknowledging that history is in fact fluid, fugitive, and not easily defined, continuously push, pushing up against the present moment. And so in some sense we wanted to look backward in order to look forward, to suggest that strategies of appropriation and institutional critique are still viable as critical forms that can be activated in the present, not a movement or a genre that is relegated to the past. We also recognize that Oh good, now it's just doing its thing. Um, we also recognized that our exhibition was one version of this history and that hopefully there would be many more um, exhibitions that take up the subject and tell the story differently. And certainly there have been a number of recent exhibitions over the past, say, five years dealing with this particular period, not necessarily this particular subject. Um, and it, for us, it was also important to map different historical trajectories, and we were committed to examining feminism as the foundation for much of this work. So we began the exhibition not with the figures most commonly identified as the primary progenitors of institutional critique, Michael Asher, Marcel Broders, Daniel Buren, and Hans Hacke, but instead with three significant women artists who have been deeply influential to the younger artists and who radically altered the landscape of artistic practice in the US, Mary Kelly, Adrian Piper, and Martha Rossler. And for us, this was an equally relevant starting point that had been insufficiently explored to date in the critical and art historical discourse around institutional critique. Um, sorry, these are just sort of notes that I'm responding to. Um, we also thought a lot about the fact that curatorial process is often behind the scenes, so to speak, and that for a lot of people it's a bit of a, a mysterious process. They don't necessarily know a lot about how um, curators go about their work. And so one decision that we made in the introduction to the catalog that Johanna and I co-wrote was to try to be um, more transparent about that curatorial process than is perhaps typical. And so, in the, in the introduction, we talked a lot about the process and really trying to underscore that ind indeed it is a process and that um, we wanted in some ways to resist the impression that exhibitions, once they are executed, are realized in a final and perfectly formed argument. That in fact, that in some ways it, it's just another stop along the process and that indeed if we had done the show a year later, in fact it would have been a very different show. So in the introduction to the catalog, we actually talked about how the show originated, what our, what our early ideas were, how much they changed over time as we worked on the show. Um, in fact, they, it changed rather dramatically. And we addressed things like why certain artists weren't included, recognizing that when you say appropriation, everyone asks you if Jeff Koons is in your exhibition. And in fact, no, he was not. 
And so we wanted to, rather than sort of avoid that, um, we actually talk about it and talk about that, that choice. We talked about artists that we had hoped would be in the exhibition that weren't and the reasons for that. And um, just tried to also talk a bit about our working process together as collaborators um, in the work. So um, one last point I'll make, and you can maybe gather that this is actually one of my favorite installations, um, is that uh, maybe you can gather this from the images that you're seeing. We also really wanted to highlight, in some sense, the objects um, as material objects in the exhibition. When you talk about appropriation, um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the world of images and institutional critique as a kind of working methodology, um, people generally understand that work to be highly conceptual and driven by its ideas, and the, the objecthood and the material um, attention that the artists have is often um, sort of uh, played down. And so we wanted to make an argument visually as you went through the exhibition that in fact these are artists who are very devoted to the object and very carefully craft objects and um, in some ways highlight that as, as an experience for the viewer. So I'm going to leave it at that because I've probably gone on too long. I just want to say that Sarah is going to talk about um, the exhibition we did together at the Hammer and hopefully we'll have some time and conversation to talk a little bit about um, working together because Sarah is an artist who I've had the pleasure of getting to know. I was thinking about this last night, I think almost a decade, is that even possible? Yeah. Okay, we're all getting older. <laughs> um, met probably a decade ago and, and was taken with her work almost immediately and I've had um, the opportunity to work with her in different capacities over time and I feel that that's just been a, a great pleasure for me in my own work and so maybe we can get into some of the, the curator artist type relationships that occur in our field. Okay. Thank you, Anne. That was so great and so exciting to see some of those installation images and to see the translation um, of the exhibition as well. Uh, and here's more of it. <laughs> it never ends. And it was very cool. <laughs> I'm just advancing to my um, uh, presentation. Well, so I'm, I'm so thrilled to be speaking here uh, and um, I'm hoping some of you were able to see my presentation last night on my father Stan Vanderbeek's work uh, so that there is some familiarity um, because I'm going to uh, jump into discussing a project that I did, and I think it's where you and I met, maybe for the first time, um, in this idea of translation of some of the tenets of Black Mountain College and some of the things that I garnered from his work and his being and his um, engagement with community. And But I wanted to begin with uh, just where he and I met, which was... Um, in this jacuzzi in our backyard. <laughs> um, these are Polaroids that I uh, brought from um, our family archive and I wanted to begin there because uh, I am speaking about an artist but I'm also speaking about a father and a family member and again as I was speaking of last night he's one of a larger community that really helps to inform and impact my approach and um, work as an artist and a teacher and an individual in the world. So there's an image of my mother, there's an image of my brother who's here, um, Max Vanderbeek, there's my father, and there's my sister August Vanderbeek there as well. And this is all in our home in Relay, Maryland, which is where my father lived the later part of his life as an instructor at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. 
Um, and something also just that I find um, significant about these is that these Polaroids were expired film that he purchased from some kind of discount store. He was always looking for a good deal and a way to execute his work with, um, with little means um, uh, and always incredibly inventive. But the flashes and fades of the photograph to me speak of the kind of the, the power of imagery, the, the way in which um, it captures these fleeting moments moments, but also has an aura and a quality to itself. And thinking about object-based exploration of charting a, a school or a life or a career or a practice, um, to me, I'm very interested in the archive and going through these documents and um, using them as ways to, uh, when I work with my father's estate, inform the way that we um, stage his work, but also learn more and more about him and the time period in which he was working. And something we touched on last night is that my father really was this incredible conduit to this other time uh, of um, that is continually influential and impactful to my way of thinking. And that's um, sort of, at, it's a, quite a broad range of time, the 20th century. But um, uh, he was born in 1927, and he attended Black Mountain in um, 49 to 51. And then he came to New York and was actively engaged with this post-war art community. Um, and then in the 70s, he moved to Baltimore, Maryland, where I was born. and. Um, where I grew up. And um, this is an image of uh, w one of his movie drone presentations. This is not at the dome that uh, Gloria pictured earlier. This is um, at Central Park in this um, in a sort of army tent that was repurposed for this multimedia experience and um, immersive environment uh, that was following along similar ideas of the movie Drome. But um, as I said last night, he took the show on the road. He, he had this um, experience travel in various different aspects and installations. Um, and I, uh, this is at what is called a, the design and it was like a, um, an event um, sort of s shortly after. It does say Stony Point, but I'm, um, that the point of this is that I'm correcting that slightly in that sometimes when we're doing the, this archival research, a lot of it also has to be interpreted. So I think that's where I'm getting a little to the um, sense of interpretation talking here. Um, and the also something that is significant about my father's work and something that I think a great deal about now as I'm an exhibiting artist and one that uh, believes that artists should engage and participate in their community is also writing and um, recording uh, thoughts and ideas and considering how they can be conveyed out into um, the public sphere. And my father was a, a incredibly prolific in many different um, forms of media. Uh, as I showed last night, he, um, he worked in photography at Black Mountain, painting, uh, but then rapidly moved into film and moving image and uh, digital, um, or early digital animation, computer uh, generated animation. But at the core, I think, and at the foundation of it is an understanding of language and the importance of language. And that can be a visual language, an image-based language, and that can also be the written word. So I've gone through many of his notebooks and I'm continually struck by the thoughts and ideas that he has. Um, and he wrote manifestos such as the Culture Intercom, um, which really pushed forward for a universal image language. But he also wrote very thoughtful and um, um, quite meditative and insightful and poignant uh, poems and uh, prose. And I think in encountering this later in my life and, la and later in my engagement with his work, it's consistently encouraged me to think about how, um, again, the importance of language and um, the importance of careful observation and, although I'm not dis displaying it here, succinctness and a focus. Uh, so that's, again, just to ground a little bit in where I'm going now. Um, so 
I wanted to focus on an exhibition that I organized. Um, I am uh, primarily a visual artist, but for six years, um, from 2003 to 2009, I co-operated an artist-run gallery space called Guild and Gray School in Soho um, with two other artists, one of them being my brother, Johannes Vanderbeek, and the other artist, Anya Keeler. And we founded this uh, gallery with no idea what we were doing, um, no business sense, uh, and Yet it was actually a commercial enterprise, one that was not profitable, but we were not profit. We were not a nonprofit. Uh, but we founded Guild and Gray School with an ideal of creating a space and community in which to engage and support our peers and in which to activate an area of New York that was rapidly being turned over and, and fewer and fewer artist spaces and artists were living there as well. This is Wooster Street in the early 2000s. It was, we were across from one of the last operating factories in Soho at that time. It was a chocolate covered cherry factory and it was, <laughs> It was like seeing a, a complete transition of the city, you know, before our eyes. And it was vital and important for us to be in that area uh, because of the history that our, uh, Johannes and I, our father, had had with that area and because of the history of artists activating spaces throughout the 20th century, as I was speaking of earlier, and particularly the post-war time in New York. So this exhibition, um, and, and just one more thing I'd like to say about the gallery is that to me it is actually an extension of um, some of the, the experiments at Black Mountain College because we were looking at our father's um, uh, role as a student there and his engagement with the community, perhaps in a very idealistic way, but really as a model of how artists could participate. It, this gallery was, if anything, an experiment in participation. And uh, this exhibition that I organized was sort of towards the end of the run of the gallery. Uh, the Human Face is a Monument was taken from the title of one of my father's films. It's one of my favorite films of his. And the film charts uh, life, similar to Steichen's Family of Man, charts life through these found images from the Magnum uh, collection of birth to death. And it's set to Vivaldi's Four Seasons. I suggest if you're interested, you can go to Ubu Web and it is um, online and viewable there. Um, I don't have time to show the film, but it was um, a um, motivation and inspiration for this exhibition, which was looking at artists from different generations approaching the figure through collage. And, uh, and I'd say also assemblage and, and, and considering certain things of appropriation. Um, the artists in the exhibition were Mae Wilson, uh, Sarah Greenberger Rafferty, who is a peer of mine, um, uh, Sarah Charlesworth, who um, was a, a good friend, but we actually sort of, we met prior to this, but we actually really came to know each other um, extensively through this process. I asked her to produce a new work for the exhibition and worked very closely with her to realize it. Um, Martha Rossler, Anya Keeler, and then in the back room, as I showed earlier, was um, a selection of works by Stan Vanderbeek, my father. And um, to me, what was important about this exhibition was manifold, but, oh, and Dana Hoey, excuse me, Dana, for, for getting you in the um, artist list, was that also, was that there was this connection between generations, there was um, this sense also of uh, learning and through doing, because many of the um, artists involved were also teachers and had a cross dis, uh, dialogue and, and um, interdisciplinary uh, means of working that I think was similar to what was happening at Black Mountain. Um, and for me, it was also an incredible learning experience. Not just this exhibition, but the entire project. Um, here are some details of one of Sarah Charlesworth's works and a still of Martha Rossler's video, and it's Martha Rossler Reads Vogue. And uh, this is an installation view of uh, Mae Wilson's 
Um, and Mae Wilson has a connection to Black Mountain in, uh, in that her son Bill Wilson works very closely with Ray Johnson's estate. And, um, but what I thought was also really incredible about Mae Wilson's work, she's um, a lesser known artist, was that it felt incredibly um, contemporary in its sort of fragmentation of the body. And yet this was made using found imagery from pinup magazines. And was working, she was working in a similar way as my father in appropriating ubiquitous, um, uh, f cheap found imagery to create these kind of revelatory, uh, striking, and powerful works. And I, I would say that the entire process of doing the gallery was very much an education in itself. I went to Cooper Union, similar to um, uh, my father, Johannes, and Anya. There was a great um, community of artists in and around Cooper Union. We worked with a great number of them at the gallery space. Uh, but that we felt after Cooper there was a a lack and need and support um, uh, you feel as a student once you've left the structures of school, all of a sudden everything that you took for granted and complained about, like, you know, the, the endless structure of critiques and feedback, you know, like, <laughs> that was like grinding at the time, but then you missed it incredibly once you no longer had it, and um, the facilities. So what we wanted with Guild and Gray School was to fill that space for this community as well. And what I learned um, tremendously from it was uh, that I took from it as an artist later was watching artists move from idea to implementation to final um, exhibition. And so I didn't, and so this is all to get to, I didn't go to graduate school. And I consistently think of Guild and Gray School as my form of graduate school in that I really learned through working with artists of different generations. I learned about exhibition making through watching these artists take their idea to full realization. And then I learned how to, um, how the work then enters from the exhibition space into the larger world. And that happened through many different um, ways. Uh, and all of this was um, incredibly important to then how, when we began working with my father's work, uh, we considered how we staged exhibitions of his work, how it went into um, institutional spaces, and then also how I, as an exhibition maker, when I began showing work, thought about exhibitions and my role and engagement as an artist in the world. This is a fax mural that was shown in um, the exhibition of my father's work in the back room. And um, I touched on, I, I really stayed last night focused on his early works in and around uh, and informed by Black Mountain. This is slightly later and, um, but, uh, and was at one point shown and created here. And what's so amazing about this fax mural to me is that uh, whenever we show it now, contemporary, first off, we have to find a fax machine. Um, and that's a process in itself. Uh, but you, that's where you begin to realize is how much he was pushing the technology to realize his ideas. Uh, because the, in, the idea of this work, which I think is so interesting, was that he was in one location and it would be transmitted to another location. And so, and this was in the 60s and 70s, the very early stages of this technology, which now, you know, we laugh about because everything is created, um, uh, you know, and, and um, transmitted digitally incredibly easily but that this was rendered in real time in an exhibition space. He would be transmitting it in real time, which would then have this delay, and the, the, um, due to the slow process of the fax machine, but that you would get this sense of the artist creating an image in front of your eyes through um, this collage and transmission. And I think that's really still powerful today, is the, the meeting of the hand of the artist with the technological. And I think that that's something that I take a great, um, that I consider a lot in my work and how, um, uh, and, and in teaching as well, how when we're at this incredibly interesting crux of the meeting of the mechanical and the technological at this moment, particularly in photography, how we can sort of access and use all aspects of the strengths of these two approaches together to render and create um, the, uh, the most compelling outcomes. And he was consistently at 
the forefront of these developing technologies, but he was also grounded in a consideration of material, a consideration of craft, and a consideration of the hand that I think really was founded and developed at Black Mountain College. So all of that consistently informed our approach at Guild and Gray School. And then in, um, I was like, is this the hook? Am I, <laughs> am I going to And again, uh, the, what was also so exciting for me about this project was that at one point we had the opportunity to stage and present a, um, the first kind of rough overview of my father's work. Um, and this was in 2008, the same year that I did um, The Human Face is a Monument. And uh, this was, this is an installation view of it. But it was one of a larger exhibition program. And I think what was also incredibly um, informative to me in being in this space and being a constant was seeing how the space changed with every different artist's approach to the exhibition. Um, so what was exciting was then when we were able to um, work with his work within this space and completely transform it, um, but then, you know, the next show would be a completely different feeling, and this is an installation by Mariah Robertson um, up here as well. And, and then to kind of situate our father's work within this younger community, which was important to me because, um, as we were speaking last night, you know, when he died, the um, uh, sort of, the shows and the interest and the exhibitions uh, um, sort of tapered off. So there was quite some time where people were not seeing or familiar with his work. And then all of a sudden we brought out this kind of uh, major overview and artists like Mariah and other artists that we worked with and many artists in New York were completely blown away because here's an artist in the 50s and 60s thinking about a lot of the things that they're thinking about now and making work then that feels incredibly of this moment. And I think what's exciting about his work is that I think it's just gonna continue to go along with um, the changes and continue to resonate for years and years to come. Um, so now, as my time is nearing up, I'm gonna um, skip into some of my work to lead to the Hammer Project, which then I think is a good point for us to start talking together. But I think the thing I have to be incredibly grateful for was this sense of encouragement through my understanding of this individual and of artists of that time and that community to take the risk to do this. Again, as I said, we had very little knowledge of what we were doing. And in some ways that was important to us, that all of this was an experiment and open for failure and open for um, the opportunity to succeed and open in that openness bringing different uh, voices and people and individuals into the dialogue. Um, so in 2009, uh, with, we had to close the gallery with the economic downturn. But I had already begun showing in 2006, and a lot of the things that I learned from the gallery, as I said, really came into my approach of uh, making um, work. Uh, before the gallery, I had not had a very studio-based practice, and we had studios in the basement of the gallery and the exhibitions on the, um, the street level. So it was um, in an ideal situation, we'd be working during the day with artists on the exhibitions, and then in the evening, we'd go downstairs into the basement and be working on our own work. And that worked for quite some time until the um, our exhibition schedules of all three artists involved with the, um, with the project became such that we needed to really dedicate more and more time to our own practices. And so I, uh, I was sad and sorry to have to close the gallery because I really enjoyed the, the dialogue and um, the role of supporting artists and this idea and thinking that somehow we were continuing on uh, ideals of another time as well. But I, I c continue to draw upon it and feel that it is 
very much, as I was saying, sort of like my graduate training, it's very much my foundation for thinking in the ways that I approach making images and objects and installations. So this is quickly to go through um, when working at, um, with, during the gallery and in that studio, I was making a lot of tabletop constructions that were um, meant to exist in their final form as photographs. So these are assemblages that then I would capture and present as a photograph. This photograph is about this big, and it's um, about the same size as the structure I created. And then the other thing that I would say is in my father's um, uh, writings and attention to language, I think I really developed an appreciation for poetry. And poetry is something that I continue to go back to as a starting point and as something that I, I look and think about in relationship to photography. And how can my photographic practice emulate that of a poet's, of the acute observation, of the succinctness, of the um, thinking of, of sequencing and rhythm and timing as images move throughout a space. And so Walt Whitman is someone who I, I look at a lot. I'm currently doing a piece inspired by E.E. E. Cummings' poem. Um, and this I wanted to show is another page from my father's notebooks. And um, I was speaking last night about time, and here is his charting of time. Um, but I think, you know, I also encountered these other pages where he's um, writing about Thoreau around the time of Black Mountain, and he's, uh, you know, working with M.C. Richards. And um, I, uh, I, I consistently draw upon that, um, and in, um, at the Whitney Museum, I created a work that was inspired by Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, and um, you know, each frame was sort of like a phrase in the poem. And even though these are still images, I think of them often as sequences in a sort of montage-like um, narrative, although it may be sort of abstract and, and it's sometimes a staccato pattern jumping back and forth between images. So I think that uh, his relationship to language, to the moving image, to thinking about the power and import of images in this current world all continue to in inform and impact the way that I am working as an artist. And I'm just going to flip through these a second. These are all from uh, my project to think of time at the Whitney Museum of American Art, all inspired uh, by Walt Whitman's poems and taken in various sites throughout America and also within my studio. But at this point, I'm still constructing things for the camera and um, to result in a final photographic form. There's casts, and um, they, these are three-dimensional actual objects, but they're, they're being kind of collapsed and conflated with the 2D. And I'm consistently interested in how photography uh, confuses our sense of scale and space in this quite um, uh, inspiring way. These are images of foundations from New Orleans. Uh, this, was, this exhibition was up during the, the anniversary of um, Katrina. Uh, the, and this exhibition, which is now getting to where we're talking about the hammer, this exhibition was uh, created prior to um, my residency at the Hammer Museum, thanks to Anne Elgood. And um, during the course of creating uh, the works for the Whitney Museum, I uh, began to wonder why I was creating things for the camera and not showing the actual objects. And during the course of the residency at the Hammer Museum, I was encouraged by Anne and by the time and space and um, uh, support that surrounded that residency leading to the exhibition to consider new ways of working and experimenting. And again, I think this goes back to black consideration of Black Mountain models, but also the importance of a pedagogical approach to exhibition making. And it was, um, it's felt to me that this was the ideal situation in which to explore a new way of working involving installation, performance, and an attempt to use the internet as an extension of the exhibition space. And this, the, the support the residency provided and the time and space in which to allow the project to evolve 
felt as close to a pedagogical setting as I think I had experienced since Cooper Union. And it continues to be a project that I learn from and draw upon as I move forward. Okay, and then we can just click through these as we talk. Can I, can I just jump in and if you have a chair at your table, could you raise your hand because we do have some people here at the back that need to sit down or would like to sit down. So go sit down if you see a hand. Sorry, Gloria. No problem. Go, do you want to go ahead and kind of talk through the images then? Is that a better? Yeah. Because one of the things I wanted to do then is to kind of, you know, one of the things is to kind of open up now to, for questions and, and comments from the, from the tables and, and those in the room as well. So I think before you have two different models of collaboration and definitions of community laid out, I think, very elegantly in both cases of this idea of a kind of civic and institutional sense of community, but also a community of artists and a self-organizing sense of making something happen for a community that wasn't necessarily being addressed um, as well, and models of collaboration, again, both institutional um, and then thinking about a kind of collaboration between curator and artist. Um, and I'm really grateful for, for Sarah and for Anne for sharing um, those processes with us today. So again, I really want to open up quickly to think about some thoughts or, um, that came here, please. Yes, and please to kind of I, I have enunciate or sort of speak up in the... Okay. Sorry. Let's speak yeah. in the mic. Thank you. Um, or project, you, yeah. You mentioned um, the word that kept on coming into my mind was the definite or a, a lack of definition of what, any, what the two of you meant by community. There's the internal community, let's say, within Black Mountain, but then in part because of where I come from and what I do, I'm interested in the larger non-Black Mountain, non-institutional community surrounding the centerpiece. And so, um, is there, any, and maybe I'm misunderstanding what you guys are after or have been after, but I would like to see if there are ways to link what is going on in the gallery or at Black Mountain for that matter, with the larger community within which it's sat, it's sat whether it's Asheville or whether it's the world at large, and how do you bring in members of that, that community to the larger world, in other words, to the work that is going on and how that becomes um, an iterative uh, process. Or maybe is, is just to kind of think about te teasing that out a little bit more, the idea of the difference between public and audience, too, in a certain way, maybe? Like thinking again about a public, like audience building and institution building are stu two different demands put on a curator for an exhibition and who the audience is kind of question. I, mean, I think that's a, it's a great question and it's um, a complicated question. I think, um, of course, when we say community, we mean communities. I, I think whenever we try to talk about things as if they're this sort of homogeneous, you know, mass, it's, it's inaccurate. Um, I think w what we try to do at the Hammer just in general is to offer such a variety of programming and uh, knowing that different projects will pull in different um, audiences and different publics, different communities. In, in terms of Black Mountain College, I think one thing that we're thinking through right now for the presentation at the Hammer is how we can use the public programs and the performative elements of the exhibition to um, both encompass a larger trajectory of, of who the Black Mountain um, artists and uh, who, who they touched in their careers both at Black Mountain College and after. Um, and in that sense, I think thinking through kind of what we're doing today, like what are the residues, what are the influences, and trying to bring in some voices of um, practicing artists today, but also people who are maybe connected in some way or another to people from Black Mountain, and to bring them in to reflect on, on those relationships. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's interesting. Uh huh. Other questions are in the back. Project. Yeah. We'll get the mic to you. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to be a little contrarian. So I thought one of the most provocative things um, in Sarah's talk was um, when you said, 
we were for profit and then corrected yourself and said we were, sorry, you said we were not for profit and then you corrected yourself and said we were not not for profit. And I thought that that slippage, um, not only of your tongue, but in the sort of like mechanisms that you were dealing with is actually one of the most interesting things about the type of space that you made. Um, and rather than, you know, we were in a former chocolate covered cherry factory that, you know, Soho changed before our eyes, like you changed Soho before our eyes. Uh, you know, I assume that you signed contracts and put up drywall and made a former space of capitalist labor into a white cube. So, um, you know, is there a way in which, although you traced a lot of the connections between the spirit of Black Mountain College and um, the exhibitions you organized there and your residency at the Hammer, is there, you know, your residency at the Hammer, I assume, was something that was paid unlike a lot of the professors who were invited to Black Mountain College for the first few years, um, who were only given room and board, is there um, a way in which actually the connections between Black Mountain College and your project in New York are that the market mechanisms of 2000, the, the robustness of the market between 2006 and nine, especially in a place like New York, um, made a project like Black Mountain College during the Great Depression impossible. Mm -hmm. Not the connections, but actually what was repressed. Well, I'm glad that like in my half awake state, because this is, this is quite early for me, <laughs> that that slippage provided uh, a good window into um, something that I do think about in that there was this confluence of events that allowed Black Mountain to be possible that when we were coming up as artists then in the early 2000s to now is a completely different set of circumstances. And I think in trying to create this hybrid model that in ways worked and in ways completely failed, as I said, we were a commercial enterprise that basically operated as a nonprofit because we, um, we were barely able to support ourselves, um, was thinking a lot about how much the scenario, and particularly in New York, had changed for artists. And I think, um, uh, and, and how I think now, when we talk about engagement with the community, we're also talking about this kind of entrepreneurial um, activity that is happening with artists in which you have to really kind of, um, in some ways, uh, sort of make, you know, make the structures for yourself um, because there is, of course, the conventional structures of the galleries still in place and the, and the commercial, the one of the art worlds is the commercial art world, but I think less and less that's a sustainable model for artists to live and work, particularly in a, an area such as New York where it's um, consistently compounded with rising costs and decreasing space. Uh, but. I might not be answering your question because I didn't, um, uh, so I apologize. I'm, I'm just kind of riffing off of what I gathered from your question. Or maybe if I could interject quickly yeah. too. I mean, one of the things to think about is that there's a romantic version of Black Mountain College that becomes even more romanticized the distance we get from it. And we forget the, the real sort of fiduciary constraints and issues and state funding and civic discourse, not to mention the international relations of emigres coming over if fleeing World War II. I mean, this was not an anodyne moment where sort of immigration and migration was was being sort of aped or an analogy or a metaphor. These were sort of very pernicious conditions in different moments. And I think there's a way in which now to think back at a sort of Habermasian idea of a pure public space does not exist. All of them had real, like I said, other kinds of pressures, financial and, and otherwise. And it's oftentimes, as the historian, it's easy to sort of say the current conditions in the market pressures brought to bear on contemporary art feel even more pressing. If you only have to read Alan Capro, The Artist is the Business in 1961 to kind of see those other roles as well. So I think there's a tendency to kind of, uh, in terms of a hyperbolic language around market that happens in contemporary moment, but if we look at it, the ratio and, and correlation to an earlier moment to pretend that it wasn't there also, I think is a, is a sort of misrecognition as well. So I think we have to kind of caution that kind of hyperbolic way that the market has come into place too. Quick well, other thoughts or questions too, or? Sorry, over here. Uh, 
Thank you. Yes, I'd like to ask you to connect anybody uh, the values of experimentalism from Black Mountain College uh, to some of these questions of curatorial practice that you've been describing. Um, the, uh, the idea of translation, um, bringing one exhibition conceived of in relation to a historical theory and a particular space and translating it into an aesthetic uh, presentation using the material that was historically organized. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to uh, just toss in another contemporary practice, which is to go back to um, past exhibitions with historical importance and to restage those exact, or as exact as possible, exhibitions. And there's a whole uh, philosophical and historical question of, can you step into the same stream twice? Um, so what is the, uh, what is your feeling, what is the influence of Black Mountain experimentalism on your curatorial escapades? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And also I'll just give, you know, we, we have um, Carol Stacanus, Jim Voorhees, and Ruth Erickson, again, another kind of, um, I wanted to, you know, kind of talk about the plurality of curatorial models, so they'll be coming up shortly um, to also bring up more direct connections around this um, invocation of experimentalism, too. So I just wanted to, you know, make everyone aware of that. They're sort of on deck for that, too, in case... Um, we could push that question. I mean, I, I think I hope I tried to address some of that in my presentation. I think um, I, I was struck by in, in your question this the the question of restaging historical exhibitions or some portion of them, and, and I think that. It's a really interesting conundrum. I think we've seen some of that happening, um, and in the area of performance, actually, there's a lot of debate around um, re-performing pieces, etc. We can't get into today, but um, I mean, the, the issue of the so-called first happening at Black Mountain College and how that might be represented or not through the Black Mountain College exhibition is, I think, an interesting model. Um, the ICA has invited artists to come in and, and make an interventions more in the spirit of that happening with a recognition that it's not really clear what happened at that first happening. We know some of what happened, but not all. It's not really possible to recreate it as such. Um, but I think there are a lot of um, ways to think through that that issue, and in the Take It or Leave It exhibition, I'll just give this as an example, uh, we really struggled with how to present group material. Um, we wanted group material to be in our exhibition, but this is a collective of artists that has long disbanded and was very much devoted to responsiveness to um, particular issues in the time, whether it was the AIDS crisis or the situation in South America. Um, and when we approached uh, the participants in, in the group, uh, particularly Julie Alt, to start a conversation, we realized that it actually felt as though it would somehow be inappropriate to, to restage one of their installations. They were not interested in doing that themselves. They invited us to come into the archive and do it ourselves, almost act as artists with their material. And in the end, we just felt that, and we addressed this in the introduction, that, that this was a project that really existed in a time and place. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't recreate it in a way that felt sort of authentic to the spirit of what they were doing. And so we just chose not to include them, which was something to this day I, I regret on some level and then also feel like we made the right decision. So I think in each case, you have to really struggle with the particular contingencies of that situation. Thank you, Anne. And on that note, I think we're going to hear from next is Ruth Erickson, curator at the Institute of Contemporary Art, who and Jim Voorhees at the Carpenter Center at Harvard University, and Carol Stacanus, our colleague here at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, will continue that line of questioning in the next um, group of panelists. Thank you again. I'm sensing a lot of unruly energy in the room, which I really like. Um, it's not oh, every day that you get it for an academic conference. Um, so thanks again to everybody for being here, and I hope that all of you have had, had a chance or will have a chance to go over to the ICA to see Leap Before You Look. Um, and I'm just going to launch right in here. 
So until a few weeks ago, this was the state of our exhibition at the ICA. This is a model that lived in the curatorial office for uh, the last four years, three of which I've been working with Helen uh, to put together the exhibition at the ICA. And we knew even from this point that we wanted performance to be a really important part of the program because dance and theater and music were such an important part of life and learning at Black Mountain College. So some of this was quite easy to resolve early on. We have a 20 by 20 foot dance floor in the exhibition in which Silas Reiner, uh, who had worked with the Merce Cunningham Dance Company, has been working with students from the Boston Conservatory and from Harvard to learn excerpts of Merce Cunningham dances. We also have a restaging of Catherine Litz's The Glyph Dance, who was also a choreographer at Black Mountain College, by the dancer Polly Motley. So it was quite easy to think of, okay, well, how can we have dance be part of the exhibition? It was also an early decision to include a grand piano in the show, which is a place where we have invited performers um, to play cage pieces, play pieces by Eric Satie, Pierre Boulet, uh, as well as we're going to be preparing this piano a la cage during the course of the exhibition. A harder thing to think about how it would make a place in the exhibition was the notorious theater piece number one. So as the story goes, the composer John Cage conceived of the performance in the morning at Black Mountain College, perhaps over breakfast uh, on the dining hall porch overlooking the aptly named Lake Eden at Black Mountain College. And by evening, he had uh, invited uh, had convinced Robert Rauschenberg, David Tudor, Merce Cunningham, Charles Olson, M.C. Richards, Nicholas Cernovich, and perhaps others to take part. Cage recalled the event in a 1969 interview as follows, quote, I simply drew upon the resources of the community. I knew, for instance, that I could give a lecture with long silences in it, which I had already prepared, and that during that phrase, so to speak, or that duration, that other things could go on. And so I invited Olson and M.C. Richards to read their poetry, and perhaps there was someone else. I don't know. Robert Rauschenberg to show his paintings on the ceiling of the dining hall, and also to play recordings of his choice, and David Tudor to play music of his choice." End quote. So much of what we know this, of this event is through remembrances, and undoubtedly misremembrances, as no two recolle recollections, as Anne has already suggested, match. Now the closest memory that we have is the diary of a student named Francine Duplessis, who wrote that night in her diary, quote, at 8.30 tonight, John Cage mounted a stepladder, and until 10.30 p.m., he talked of the relation of music to Zen Buddhism. While a movie was shown, dogs barked, Merce danced, a prepared piano was played, whistles blew, babies screamed, coffee was served by four boys dressed in white, and Edith Piaf records were played double speed on a turn of the century machine." End quote. So on the right, we have uh, the writer, ceramicist, and pedagogue M.C. Richards, who Gloria has already invoked as an incredibly per important person to this story and to American art. We have her drawing and her, her memory of the event as it was drawn in 1989. So you can get a sense of what, what she recalled going on. Some of the other memories that we've collected uh, include the ceramics teacher David Weinrib, who reported that Rauschenberg played popular records from the 1920s, and that Charles Olson distributed a poem and instructed audience members to stand up and read it, and that M.C. Richards recited poems by Edna St. Vincent Millay from atop a ladder. The dance teacher, Catherine Litz, recalls the entire evening taking place in French, and that Richards came in on a horse or some kind of moving structure. Carol Williams, a printmaking instructor, remembered the projection of hand-painted 35 millimeter slides and colorful gels. And Cernovich, the student and filmmaker, claims to have projected fragments of a new silent black and white film he was working on at the time. And differing accounts suggest that the surface of this film may have been a screen, the ceiling, or in fact Robert Rauschenberg's white paintings hanging from the ceiling. So such variations, and there are many more, result from the vagaries of memory, but they also reflect the structure of the event itself. And in this milieu of great mismemories, and in this place where thousands of photographs were taken of the most mundane daily tasks, incredibly, there's just one material scrap of evidence that so far has been located of this event. And it is this piece of paper in the New York Public Library. This is the score for the projectionist. 
So as you can see on this score, uh, Cage has written out the sort of brackets of time within which the projectionist will, will illuminate the projection. So it begins, begin at 16 minutes, play freely until 23 minutes, and so on. So ostensibly, everybody received a piece of paper like this, and they brought their own interests and work to bear on the duration and the space between. So one can then imagine this great simultaneous set of uncoordinated actions taking place and unfolding in space. And it's this sort of resistance to a formal coherence in exchange for a series of chance encounters happening in time that, of course, leads to the kind of mismemories and misrecollections and different experiences that people had of this singular event. There was no privileged sight line. There was no privileged point of view from which one watched going on. And indeed, everyone's experience of what happened that night was probably unique and different. So what do we do then? What do we make of this in the context of an exhibition? How do we bring in the sort of ideals and structures that were present or perhaps present in theater piece number one in the context of a historical exhibition at a contemporary art place? So one of the ways that we have done this um, is that we brought together a series of John Cage's scores. So looking at what else was happening in August in 1952, what else was John Cage working on at Black Mountain College? One of the things that he did, uh, there were an, a tremendous amount of concerts. It's actually incredible when you look at just the calendar of events from August of 1952. He played for the second time uh, Sonatas and Interludes, uh, one of his master works that actually premiered the very first time that Merce Cunningham and John Cage came through Black Mountain College in the spring of 1948. It was played again. And on the side here, you see the incredible preparations for the piano that this, that this piece required. So it took between two and three hours to complete, and a total of 45 notes were prepared, mainly with screws, bolts, but also, and he, did, he lists this, 15 pieces of rubber, four pieces of pl plastic, six nuts, and one eraser. So kind of this great tactile experience of really constructing in the piano. We also have on view in the exhibition a Williams Mix. So this summer of theater piece number one at Black Mountain College, Cage had actually planned to work on Williams Mix this summer. This is a composition of electronic music that's made from the tedious cutting and splicing of magnetic tape to create a collage of sound, the kind of beginning of electronic music it's often talked about. So we see here a graphic score of where Cage wanted those cuts and splices to happen on these eight magnetic tapes that he had brought down with him. Now, uh, uh, infamously, no students signed up for Cage's course of working on Williams Mix that summer, as one can probably imagine. Um, but nonetheless, he was actively engaged in this at the same time of working on theater piece number one or coming up with it. And I think here the idea, again, that kind of duration and this graphic notation of duration is really important in this work, as well as the use of found material. Water Music, uh, arguably Cage's first performance piece. This is another score we have on view at the ICA. And it involves, apart from simply playing the piano keys, the operation of a radio, blowing different kinds of bird whistles, shuffling a deck of cards and dealing them over the piano strings, and shaking water receptacles. So what you see here are 10 sheets of 41 different details or events that are gonna happen over the course of this piece, um, detailed in, in great sort of, uh, a great detail. And Cage here is using the space of the page to equate time, so that in addition to kind of the details he's giving, the sort of pacing of these events on the page also equates this space to a kind of temporal duration that's taking place in the performance. Another score that we have is this great uh, conversation going on between John Cage. On top, you see one of 64 sheets from his concert for piano and orchestra, a sort of masterwork of 84 different notational systems using everything from the, a ruler for thinking about lengths of time as a sort of way of, of recreating co composition and notational systems to even using the imperfections on a sheet of paper and that that becomes the basis for then laying a set of notes down. And on the bottom, you see David Tudor, the great player of Cage's music, retranslating, speaking of translation, those kinds of new notational systems back into something that can be played on the piano. This is also on view at the ICA. The other piece, and you probably saw in the installation shot, an exhibition copy of Robert Rauschenberg's white paintings hanging from the ceiling. Um, he had started working on these in the summer of 1951 at Black Mountain College, and he continued these in the summer of 1952. 
Now, Cage and Rauschenberg had first met in, uh, in New York, but they intersected many times at the college. And I can only imagine their relationship must have been quite different in the sort of pace of Black Mountain as it was in New York. Now here, rather than lacking content, the blank white surfaces have been read as receptive to the ambient shadows and environmental influence of what's happening around them. And these pieces were famously Cage cites them as really the inspiration for his four minutes and 33 seconds. Cage writes, quote, actually what pushed me into it was not guts, but the example of Robert Rauschenberg, his white paintings. When I saw those, I said, oh yes, I must. Otherwise I'm lagging and music is lagging, end quote. So in this great sort of uh, set of missed memories and lack of historical evidence, as well as the myth that has grown up around theater piece number one, what is a contemporary art museum to do? So I worked with my colleagues uh, at the museum, John Andrus and Brian Barcina, to create a, a set of performances. This is sort of the um, inside spread of a brochure that I have a stack of that I'll leave at the back. Um, of all of the performances that are taking place over the, sh over the exhibition. This includes talks, uh, dance performances, music performances, and this project we call Theater Piece Number One Times 50. So as, um, as Anne had greatly introduced, we invited five um, Boston-based, though one is no longer Boston-based practitioners, uh, Jonathan Calm, Danielle LaGrosse-George, Kelly Nipper, Damon Krakowski, and Tim McCormick to propose a set of actions that will take place in the gallery. And I think here this idea of sort of creating a space in the exhibition and giving over that content to contemporary practitioners, inviting them in to fill the museum with content, and the kind of loss of control that I think Cage also really uh, wanted through theater piece number one was something curatorially that I think has been sort of a, a growing process and a learning process for me. So this here is the very first action of the set of 50 actions that are going to kind of take place throughout the, throughout the exhibition. And I think what's great about this in some way how it feels more responsive to us to theater piece number one is that of course it's going to be impossible to see all of these just as it was impossible to see all of theater piece number one. And I think at the same time each person has really taken this kind of uh, inspiration point and taken it into sort of new directions from what theater piece number one could be. So uh, Tim McCormick's project is called Music Listens Back, and he's organizing a series of gallery performances that are inspired by John Cage, and specifically how really young composers are thinking about John Cage's practices today. So this includes, um, some of my favorite ones are going to be an hour-long tuba solo of a single note in the galleries, um, as well as a bass shakers that are placed in the piano, the kind of you know, 2015 version of the prepared piano. Theater piece number one revisited is Damon Krakowski's project, um, which is, this is the sort of set for his project on which he is perhaps hews the closest to what we think happened, um, but he's inviting visitors here in the gallery to uh, play on the toy piano you see on the floor, to plug in their iP iPhone, to play their own music from it, to play on a cassette player while he stands on top of this ladder reading a lecture. Daniela Gross George project is called Poets in Ekphrasis, uh, and this is a series of spoken word performances that are really drawing on the history of avant-garde poetry at Black Mountain College, um, as well as her own poetry, which thinks a lot about translation. Performance Art Workshop is, uh, and I know some of the students are here, this is Kelly Nipper's class at MIT, where she has really given over the sort of the space of these actions to her students who have developed a set of events that take place in the gallery based upon their own kind of rituals of their own classroom and environment. And the last project is Jonathan Calm's Passing Time, which is a series of scripted and I'd say critical performances that uncover the forgotten moments, the blanks, the gossips that were as much a part of the Black Mountain College community as what's made it in the history books. So I would say to conclude is that um, in many ways these, these proposals by these contemporary artists have also opened up what I write in the exhibition catalog as the prehistory of, of theater piece number one at Black Mountain College. And I think the ways in which the conditions were in place and were ripe for the kind of event that would come, that would be sort of created by this community at Black Mountain College. And one of those ways is the, is the great experimental theater that's happening at Black Mountain College um, all the way from 1937 when Zanti Shawinski, who had studied at the Bauhaus with Oscar Schlemmer, comes and does a series of experimental um, projects at Black Mountain College with these folded paper and abstract costumes. Uh, this is a, a still from Specto Drama, one of the plays that he does there. 
And another uh, incredible piece that was evoked in the, um, in the description for this panel is the light, sound, and movement workshop. And this is something that, I'm, that many of us are sort of actively researching and looking for more information on. This was a, a workshop that was started in 1948 by two students at Black Mountain College, uh, Elizabeth Jenner-John and Warren Pete Jenner-John. And uh, they had returned. Elizabeth Jenner-John studied uh, with Martha Graham Dance Company. And uh, her husband, Warren Pete Jenner-John, was a set designer and played music. And they returned and carried out these kind of experimental performances. So this is Warren Pete Jenner-John's notebook of those kind of performances. And what we see when we look into the archival material around these, there's, there's very little uh, documentation, no photographs again left, is that we see using the components of light, sound, and music, and really carrying out a series of, of um, experimental multimedia stage performances, where, for instance, in this one great example, uh, Pete Jenner-John remembers that we're moving in our green and red striped tights through green and red saturated light created by the green and red striped slides, slides that they would often make from the cellophane of lollipop wrappers because they couldn't afford theater gels. So one can imagine in this kind of this phantasmagoric experience of a, of a arriving and an absencing and disappearing body through the overlay of this green and white light. There's really great memories that uh, people have of these events, and here's sort of one of the presentations of them, which were essentially a series of, of uh, experimental and short skits, where again, those three components were used through a series of, of different, uh, both chance and kind of intentional procedures, and carried out in the context of Black Mountain College. And if you dig into the archives, you quickly find a lot of pictures like this, a lot of pictures of the ways in which this kind of culture of self-entertainment and costumes and parties and the kind of experimentalism that was happening in the theater went into really all parts of life and parties uh, and, and dances at Black Mountain College. In the center there is Robert Rauschenberg uh, preparing a unicorn costume. The colored picture is a picture of a 1940 Valentine's Day ball. And then we have a picture from probably the late 40s of some students. Um, I love the Kleenex on the, on the girl's uh, rump uh, of, of some students getting ready. Really kind of evocative of the Bauhaus parties as well. Another piece that I think that for me the, the um, work of theater piece number one times 50 has brought back is the kind of importance of translation. And MC Richards has already been evoked as an incredibly important person and in some ways the glue that made possible theater piece number one. And um, here she's the first person who translates Antonin Artaud's The Theater and Its Double, which had this really important idea of the independent elements of theater that nonetheless kind of retain their independence as they're happening at the same time. So that kind of uncoordinated simultaneous action. And it is only through M.C. Richards' translation of this at Black Mountain College um, in the late 40s and early 1950s that John Cage and David Tudor are able to read this really important French uh, theater, French kind of experimental theater and theory. Uh, she also stages a, a Jean Cocteau's work for the first time in the United States at Black Mountain College. So a kind of seminal figure in, in making these ideas available. And I would say to that end, just again, looking back into the archives, you come across pictures like this. You come across pictures of you know, an unnamed student, looks like a Mexican student in a sombrero at a very, in the early on the first campus at Black Mountain College. Uh, a teacher who's coming to teach Indian philosophy. Uh, they're practicing some yoga poses on a creek uh, in Black Mountain in Asheville. And Diego Rivera on one of the many trips that Ani and Joseph Albers takes to, to meet there. So I think the idea of kind of multiple languages coexisting at Black Mountain College and the forms of translation that were present uh, is something that I also think this, the sort of performances that we're hosting are able to bring out. So I'll just leave with this great image, um, and I invite you all to come and see some of the dances that are taking place at Black Mountain in the Leap Before You Look exhibition. Um, this, this dance floor and the piano are really meant to be spaces where the kind of body and breathing and energy of what it would be like to be with 60 other students uh, in the hills of Asheville, figuring out what you're doing as artists and performers. And I think the, the, the space of performance is a space where we really want to bring that energy back into the exhibition. Try and see if I can advance. Can you do it? You got it. I'm pushing the green button. Do I point it at you? 
And then I wanted to add, I was remiss in not mentioning that um, Gregory Williams, who's Associate Professor of Contemporary Modern Art History um, at Boston University, will be moderating this group of conversations as well. So, thanks. Do you want me to click for you while I stand up? Maybe. Okay. Uh -huh. That would be useful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me to join the panel today. And I have to say the deep logic on how you have structured us today is incredible. Um, so exciting to see what Ruth has shared. And it is actually a beautiful uh, handoff to the things that I would like to share with you today. Um, the first, um, so my presentation entitled Engaged After, Reflections on Works of Reinvention and Recreation, um, is an opportunity to, for me to share with you one project of inspiration, uh, Ultra Red's Silent Listen project that took place across the country from 2005 to 2006, and then two specific reinvention and re creation projects um, that I was directly involved in uh, myself. So um, let's imagine that we have a little bit more time and that we have just experienced four minutes and 33 seconds. What did you hear? When was the last time you were in this space? What is the relationship between this space and the city of Boston? When was the last time you talked about AIDS in this space? This is the protocol designed by the art collective Ultra Red that uh, created these convenings in different art spaces. The one on view uh, on, the, on the screen is the Baltimore Museum of Art. And like I said, as Ruth showed us the white paintings, in addition to the collective utilizing four minutes and 33 seconds as the entree into developing a real-time experience with communities in art museums to talk about the urgency of the AIDS crisis, they also utilized Robert Rauschenberg's uh, legacy of the white paintings to begin to activate and capture the possibility of who are we? How are we in this space? The project ultimately convened in Toronto for the International um, AIDS Conference where they took all of the recordings from every single event and then staged a whole multimedia uh, presentation where the white paintings turned into white tablecloths um, where an entire AIDS community and world engaged with the crisis. I have a really strong creative relationship with Ultra Red. Um, I have experienced the piece exactly the way you have now as well. Which leads us to the two projects I want to talk about um, where I was involved in being invited to stage a reinvention or a recreation. Um, as a part of the Alan Capra retrospective that traveled to uh, LA MOCA, uh, LACE, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, was invited to develop a reinvention or a recreation of 18 happenings in six parts. Uh, this is an image of Alan in the Rubin Gallery in 1959, beginning to prepare the, um, the space. Uh, the Rubin Gallery was in New York City on 4th Avenue. Um, the community in Los Angeles is particularly lucky because Alan's uh, estate is housed at the Getty Research Institute, and so um, to 
to begin this project, I invited the uh, artist, uh, Steve Roden, to join me in looking at the archives. And one of the other things that I want to mention, because now this is the third time you've seen archival material, I highly recommend doing it as a team-based effort, in large part because you go through moments of total excitement and focus, alternating with extreme um, conceptual and intellectual vertigo. And usually, if you're in a team, you guys don't do it at the same time. So you can actually help each other kind of move through the process. Um, and so that's one of the things that happened. Steve and I went and started looking at these amazing materials, including this sketch, um, that is supposed to be telling us how the room uh, was set up uh, at the Rubin Gallery. But then there was also this. So you start to see that um, instead of clarity, um, it just added confusion. As Steve Roden wrote, when we realized there was no complete score to be found, I'm not sure why we didn't give up. It must have had something to do with your words being so inspiring. I realize now that you didn't leave a complete score behind on purpose. I think you believed that if we found one, we'd follow it. You knew we'd come to know 18.6 differently if we built it ourselves. We struggled a lot with the concept of reconstruction, and I blame you for the lengthy discussions about missing, that missing pieces generated. Eventually, we managed to build a framework. I guess you knew we could do it, because I think your work success suggests that struggle gets you to the starting point, while an open mind is needed to embark upon the journey. The original uh, cast of performers uh, for 1806 in 1959 was Alan Capro with Rosalind Montague, Sh Shirley Prendergast, Lucas Samaras, Janet Weinberger, uh, Robert Whitman, Sam Francis, Red Grooms, Dick Higgins, John Siegel, and others. Um, one of the conversations about how we would go about building a team was um, exactly that. Do we look at the images or do we look at the ideas? And in the end, Steve and I invited um, the architect, LA-based architect Stephanie Smith, uh, to work on the environment, um, as well as inviting two other local artists, Skylar Haskard and Il Ilanda Bilera, to develop other components. Um, the creative team was joined by Ray Shalon Bloom to work on the movement, and the writer, critic, and curator Michael Ned Holty uh, to look at the texts. Um, then Simone Forti, Steve Irwin, and Flora Wiegmann were invited to become a part of the cast that did the movements. Um, Steve's uh, participation was particularly uh, important because when you look at the original images, Shirley Prendergrass is an African-American woman that is a part of the, the team. And we had a, a pretty intense conversation over what would be the motivation of casting. Is it to look at casting people that would look like the original artists? Was it looking at our community and think about connections? And in the end, um, we decided that it was not um, appropriate to just cast by appearance um, based on the uh, materials, but instead to think about our particular time. Um, we were doing this project in 2008, in spring of 2008. The country was highly charged around issues of race because uh, um, the Democratic uh, uh, candidate was uh, Barack Obama. And so we felt um, that inviting a black man to participate in the project was um, important for us to be able to acknowledge the context of our, our current time. Similarly to um, uh, the John Cage project, um, 18 Happenings in Six Parts is a multi-centric work. No one at any given time sees the entire thing. The other important thing to note about it is um, everyone who comes to be a part of the audience is given cards that direct you to sit in different rooms for the different parts. So you're constantly moving around and there's actually time between the parts. And when you look at the entire score, you find that in fact, the audience spends more time circulating with one another 
than they do actually seated and focused on the cast. The team decided that they would continue to blur the line between cast and audience um, in one of the final um, parts, um, which is this orange squeezing uh, Element. This is a, a very classic image that you often encounter when looking at 18.6. Um, and so Ray Shallon Bloom, who you can see to, uh, standing next to the table, um, would choose someone in the audience to come and do the squeezing. Um, this particular night, um, we were lucky enough to um, invite uh, Paul McCarthy to be our squeezer. And he chose, as you can see, in classic McCarthy fashion, to skip the gadget and go right for the oranges in his hands and squirrels the juice to be able to offer to people. These are the kinds of things, and Ruth has already mentioned this, at what point do we see these liberties being taken as um, identifying and uh, honoring the intention of the piece and, and when might it become um, a distraction? Um, and at a certain point, I think, um, it, that's part of the, the, the debate, right? Uh, Michael Ned Holty, who was a, a participant in this process, who has also written about it, um, commented, before the performance was research, and it was clear to me now that any act of re-performance is at the same time a curious act of scholarship. The next project that I wanted to talk about is um, uh, one working with the artist Suzanne Lacey. So, okay, got to speed up here. Um, Suzanne Lacey, unlike Alan Capro, um, is living, still living, um, although the connection is really quite strong because after Alan did his happening in 1959 in New York City, he pretty quickly moved to Southern California and worked at CalArts at a time when Suzanne was one of his students, and she often cites the importance of working with Capro to her own projects and practices. So in 1977, she was invited um, by the Women's Building and Studio Watts Workshop, specifically led by James Wood, to develop a project which she called Three Weeks in May. And originally, her idea was to create an exhibition. But thankfully, um, Sheila Levrat de Bretville, when she looked at her idea, which was to actually um, um, mark and map over a three-week period reported rapes happening in, in Los Angeles, she said, this project deserves to be out in public. And so instead, she got permission to hang the maps of Los Angeles, expanded Los Angeles uh, metropolitan area, and then every day um, it was hung in a causeway in the subterranean uh, concourse of the LA City Hall. She and a team of volunteers would come and they would mark the map with a stamp, rape. And then nine uh, lighter ones that spoke to the fact that rapes are usually greatly underreported. This is an unfortunate statistic that still happens today. Um, in addition to this um, central image of the LA rape map, the three weeks projects included over 30 events happening throughout um, self-defense workshops, consciousness raising, um, performances, um, it, uh, and press conferences. So when Pacific Standard Time came along, um, which was a moment underwritten by the Getty um, Foundation, um, they also wanted to do a performance and public art festival. And Lay stepped in to work with Suzanne to address three weeks in May. So the question became, where do we start? What do we do? We actually ended up letting the Mo LA Mocha and Paul Schimmel show the original maps in his show Under the Big Black Sun, which you see in the top corner. And we decided to work with Suzanne to create three weeks in January, which was to print a new map. Instead of being in an, uh, kind of an underground concourse, we're now at a point where we can put the map on the front of the Los Angeles Police Department directly facing City Hall. We continued the model of being able to put the um, 
reports, uh, stencil them every day. Um, we also reenacted uh, the um, myths of rape per, um, performance. Uh, again, instead of eight people um, marching around the City Hall concourse, um, we actually restaged the performance at the opening night of um, the LA Art Show with over 30 uh, intergenerational, um, in, uh, intergendered, uh, multi-gendered um, individuals um, to really uh, challenge uh, and activate uh, our community, as well as a um, uh, light pole banner campaign that included a social media uh, aspect. So, all of this is to say it's a really deep, rich, and engaged project and process and one perfect. Um, one that um, has changed a lot of individuals' lives. People have found new collaborators. Survivors have been able to share their voice, um, not only with their communities, but with the art world. Um, and uh, we continue to all move forward. Um, I'm in the, the, the bend, rounding the bend, um, just wanted to kind of return. I think there is a lot um, of opportunity in looking at works that have happened and recognizing our desire to connect with them. Um, and as Michael Netholte has stated, whether the forces that guide rape performance are driven by economic, institutional, or scholarly imperative, um, the quick answer is surely all of the above. Any notion of authenticity and or of fixing a historical work of live art as one fixes a photograph should be met with skepticism. Still, my experience in researching and rehearsing and staging 18 happenings in six parts, I gradually became convinced that the best works of performance are, by definition, destabilizing works of art, and any attempts to re-perform them should be aimed at keeping them unstable, unfixed. So I want to give the final word um, to Mike Kelly. And so if I can get some help with, with um, activating the, the link. Um, I had the pleasure and honor to interview Mike as a part of our Pacific Standard Time project. This is an image of him performing Parasite Lily um, as a part of the Public Spirit Festival in 1980. And he speaks very um, cogently about the experience of being in the Los Angeles performance art community um, in the late 70s and uh, you know, definitely uh, something I want to share with you all. I tell you what, let's do it this way. Um, I will just encapsulate what it is that he says, but uh, at some point, uh, there's just nothing like hearing him speak in his Midwestern accent. Um, you know, he spoke about how the community was so heterogeneous um, that there was... Oh, So it's working, it's just not talking to the... Hey! Thank you. Here, I'm gonna restart it, okay. It was very radical, and one thing that was really interesting about it was because none of it was sponsored by an institution. People could do whatever they wanted to do, and a lot of it was dialectical in a certain way. Like you'd have people in programs or performing whose work is dialectically opposed. And so it forced this kind of discussion between really different subgroups, really different subcultures. You know, everywhere from like fetishists who were doing fetish performances to people with a political axe to grind to people in all, all different kind of aesthetic stripes. And I really liked that about that world. And everybody sort of got along. You know, you, you had these arguments, but it was all fruitful. And I imagine young people coming into that it was an exciting learning experience. I feel the rise of, of, of kind of identity politics split all that. As each person could go off into their separate little niches, that it wasn't dialectical anymore. And then all these groups found solace in their little subgroups when in the beginning they were they were so isolated and so tiny, it forced this world. And the early days of punk was sort of like that too. Like all these bands were playing had nothing to do with each other, and uh, and, and yet 
they can only play with these two other people, for example, because they're all uh, ostracized from their communities. So when I met some of the first people I met when I came to L.A., it was like, ask them. That's what a completely different world than mine. What do I know about East L.A.? Nothing. And they were just ostracized from their community. They found a place in the art world, you know. But it wasn't it wasn't a academic art world. It was an art world where the, you know, it's just kind of people, uh, and, you know, could go there because that's the only place where they could present what they did. So that notion of dialectical heterogeneity and championing people that are ready to step out um, is definitely something I bring with me every day um, in the work that we do. So thank you so much. And Jim, are you ready? Yep. Mm. OK. Um, so thank you. And thank you, Gloria and Bree and Jenny, for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm really happy to contribute to the symposium and be a part of it with so many esteemed colleagues. And then when I received the invitation, of course, I was very excited. But as I do with everything, I began to fret about what I would speak about. And then I realized that it was the day following that I, when I would open two solo exhibitions at the Carpenter Center, and I thought there's no way I can do this, but I gathered myself and I read closer to the, some of the really important questions that were being asked here, particularly part of this module. And um, one of the things I really gravitated to is one of the questions that Gloria poses, what is the legacy of experience, hierarchy, and student-teacher relations in art making? And this element of reducing the hierarchy between faculty and students is obviously a really big part of the spirit of Black Mountain. And as I began to think about some of my interests as a curator and today running an institution of how important it is to, for me in building publics um, that also apply a similar approach to reducing the hierarchy between audiences and spectators um, so that the relationship that publics that can be students and many others have with an institution change, um, become more fluid. And I began then to look and think about some of the past projects I've made and the interests I have with the Carpenter Center as an institution and thought that how important it is for me and I think um, relevant to this conversation is how can one build publics by giving them something at stake in the public building? And so with that in mind too, it's not necessarily building publics by increasing the quantity of people that engage with an exhibition or come to an institution, but the kind and quality of engagement that the institution or an exhibition has with their various publics. So with that in mind, I'm going to speak very briefly about five projects. And these projects are rather complex, but I thought that it would at least provide a cross-section that would help give some of the thinking behind some of the activity that I've been involved with. And going into that, like just thinking that there are common threads that define much of the, the work. And the exhibitions have an intention to engage publics intellectually, socially, and spatially. And often there are big questions that are asked and maybe even drawing on philosophy, Foucault, or films that may not be widely um, watched or understood, but how do you make complex ideas porous and approachable? Um, often the projects have historical components to think about how contemporary art and our contemporary culture relates to history um, and sees it as a relevant part of our activities and interests. Also, many different disciplines come into the exhibitions that include architecture, uh, philosophy, uh, design, um, and of course, art that traverses many different mediums. And also a kind of creation of a gravitational force, and it's things that may be somewhat apparent in the last year and a half that I've been at the Carpenter Center of how to repeatedly engage with publics 
repeatedly engage with artists to create a kind of gravitational force around an institution so that those who are nearby come repeatedly and feel comfortable um, in the settings that, that is there. And lately, I'm really interested in the concept of a scene. And I think that's something I'll pretend, continue to think about over the next year is what does it mean to create a scene, a social scene that's, that's um, wrapped around events and activity that begins to identify the character of an institution because all institutions have characters. And I'm lately really interested in what is happening with the Carpenter Center in terms of a scene. Um, and something that will be even more apparent in some of the projects here is um, spatial disruption. How do you turn public space into an activated site for uh, inquiries by artists? But also, how do you use the form of a gallery, the form of institution, to break it and to give something else that's not expected, something more, something other, um, by inserting activity into a gallery that isn't normally the kind of activity that happens? And so those are some of the things that, that may help sort of under, uh, comprehend the really rough sketch that I'll give to these, these um, five projects. So the first one is um, a project that I made in Columbus, Ohio as part of an exhibition call, called Descent to Revolution. It was an invitation to five collectives who did not live in Ohio to come and make uh, exhibitions in public space. As part of the exhibition, we um, vacated the gallery, left it open almost the, during not quite 24 hours, but a number of hours every day, and it actually provided a map and brochures that pointed people out of the gallery into the public space in Ohio to go find projects or events. We, I um, rented a storefront space uh, in walking distance from Columbus College of Art and Design that became a kind of headquarters that I called Office for Collective Play. And it was the kind of distribution space um, for where the artists would gather and other kinds of programming. One part project that I made was called Audible Dwelling, which was with the collective called Learning Site. They're based out of Malmo and Copenhagen. And we, Audible Dwelling is essentially like two large speaker houses that are 12 feet wide by 20 some feet long. And they essentially were created as large speakers that one could inhabit and that would project sound into public space. And over the course of about six or seven weeks, the collective learning site was in Ohio, and we were situated in this parking lot that looks very clean compared to what it did for most of the weeks that we were building in it. And I, or, I, this project developed over the course of a year through visits by them to do research, introducing them to different artists, geographers, urban planners, and then orchestrating it so the, the building of this was incorporated into a, a upper level sculpture course at Columbus College of Art and Design. And in the fall, we undertook, began to undertake the building of it as a, as a kind of group. And um, the, the, the project unfolded in public space uh, together with students, together with people from the community. Um, the design of it, the building of it, the, um, the artists were here working with students. The project also was delayed by a number of weeks, um, which began to pose a bit, make me very nervous, and because it was late. But this was a kind of defining moment for me in terms of a curator and realizing that I was the one who was making this up and that if we could actually change the opening to next month if we wanted to. And, and also what really began to develop was like thinking about the public. The publics were the students and the people who gravitated to building these things that I don't think they even knew really what they were, but there was a kind of force around um, getting this done and, and um, and a kind of community that temporarily gathered around this, this one mission. And then even doing it in public space, it's, it was essentially like a working studio that was creating a whole lot of attention to the traffic and people driving by that essentially also that built a kind of inquisitive public. So when we finally opened it up, um, a number of people came, of course, to the opening because of not even understanding really 
what it was, but there was a really liberating um, moment for me as a curator and also running institution to think about um, that an exhibition actually can, can contract, it can breathe, uh, a narrative can change to allow an artist and, uh, and students to create something that is unpredictable and uncertain. And, and um, what we finally realized were these two very strange buildings that remained in these parking lots for about eight or nine months. And we had worked with a local artist to read a script that was a, a eventually projected in the public space as part of Learning Sites Commission. But then this was also a framework, an open invitation to students and other people who work with sound and other ideas to make proposals. And then over the course of eight months or so, a whole series of, of, um, of programs and activity uh, circled around these two things because they were they became porous and they, they essentially um, had this kind of public that began to circulate around it. So another project that I did um, was called La Clisa Redux. It was upon an invitation and a fellowship I had at the Siena Art Institute. And I was really very um, concerned about what to do. Having never been to Siena, I was required to engage in some way with the students. And I've always been very attracted to this film, La Clisa, um, by Michelangelo Antonioni, that was produced in 1962. And I can't go into the concept here, but essentially it is about a relationship between a, a female and a male character who become almost tourist figures uh, between the old Roman center and this periphery that is a kind of pre and post war uh, periphery of. of of rather strange architectural, uh, brutalist buildings that were started by Mussolini um, called the EUR. And Michelangelo Antonio only sets up these scenes that become a real tension between this, the old world center that's recognizable as Italy and this post-war moment that's not really recognizable and almost has a kind of otherworldly quality. In Siena, is a walled community with, that is very defined by its 14th century Italian history, yet it also has incredible post-war moments that exist on the periphery. So what, we, what I decided to do is the, 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 the institution rented a space for me, a very small gallery that was close to the Duomo in the center. We turned it into a workshop, an exhibition site, a space where the students would meet, and then we used 24 film stills to um, essentially like act as a spine. And we, I created five different themes that included alienation, architecture, economy, love, and urbanization. And each week I did a filmic analysis for about an hour and a half in the evenings of this film through the lens of these different themes. For about the remaining hour and a half of the seminar, um, the students who had gone out the week previously to record the city beyond the wall in their own medium, which included photography and poetry and painting, um, would discuss their work. And this is the kind of activity that is actually a really wonderful activity that often happens behind closed doors, but we made public this intellectual activity for people and then the gallery shape-shifted over the course of five weeks and their work also accumulated in this space. So it, even in Italy I was very surprised but there was this kind of repeated visits from people who were not enrolled at the Siena Art Institute and there was some kind of activity that was taking place in the evenings related to this film as well as the students actually having a little more at stake and having to talk about their work in the public realm and this open critique of their, their responses to um, their explorations of Siena. Um, also dealing in a way with the gallery site, this is an exhibition that I made called Last Year at Marienbad. Similarly, departing from another one of my favorite films by Alain René, that is an incredible film that has, was very controversial when it was made because it lacks really any cohesive narrative. 
and it also um, sort of it, it is about a kind of insistence on a fiction that becomes fact through the through the editing and through of like didn't we see each other last year at Marienbad and if one says it enough somehow these fictions become part of our biography. Uh, the exhibition included work by artists Karen Cedar, Tacita Dean, Iman Issa, David Malakovich, Gordon Matta Clark, um, Alan Sakula. The Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts wanted me to make an exhibition and program. The space was designed with um, well, essentially then what I decided to do was design and cut out a kind of space that would act as the area that would host the program that would include this wall that would encapsulate about a 500 square foot area that was made of mirrored panels. And so when someone came into the exhibition, they were confronted with these mirrored panels that would reflect work hanging in the exhibition. They were interrupted partially, not completely, um, the walls weren't completely mirrored. So one would be looking at the mirror, but also see through the wall and another work. And so the design of the exhibition encapsulated this kaleidoscopic quality of the film, but it also allowed for the uh, programming to take place within this designated space. So again, turning the gallery not from a space of objects, but, um, or a display of objects, but a, a learning site. And there were four different programs that were um, commissioned as an integral part of the exhibition that would happen in the space of the gallery. But what was important to me is that the space, when the activity wasn't taking place, the, the spectator wasn't alienated thinking that they had missed something. So the exhibition continued to perform as exhibition during, you might say, off hours. So it was again this shape-shifting space that inserts learning directly into the gallery and returning it to some of the original pump functions of a public sphere. Um, and so we had Jessamyn Fiore wrote a play that was based on Gordon Matta Clark's um, words to sort of think about some of the work that we had in the exhibition, which included the fake estates and blasts from the past. Um, Maya Schweitzer, an artist from Berlin, talked about her film um, in relation to uh, Kluge. Uh, Jens Hoffman uh, talked about, uh, gave a more of a historical kind of overview of the moment when Alain Rene's film was made. And Dan Fox uh, created this really amazing um, musical series that included all these different songs by the Smiths and others that drew on this kind of notion of, of a biography that is uncertain and then combined with uh, cri criticism that the film faced in the 60s when it was released and that took place completely in the dark. And I'm running out of time, but too quickly, moving on to the Carpenter Center. We recently closed this exhibition, Josiah McElhaney, Two Walking Mirrors for the Carpenter Center. Um, the, the space at the Carpenter Center poses a number of challenges as a public space, as an exhibition site, as a multi-use space for academic um, co courses, um, as well as exhibition. And the walking mirrors were situated for about three or four weeks in the space as objects, as sculptures that are really quite amazing, made of mirrors and cedar. Josiah also then drew what they are. The walking mirrors periodically are activated. And uh, they, by, by students, and they would walk around the, the line that Josiah drew in, in the space as the choreography. But then we teamed up with the Harvard Dance Program and Jill Johnson and her students who created a choreography on top of the choreography. And so over the course of three weeks, um, about five different performances, the walking mirrors would begin to take their actions and the students would essentially act as different kinds of guides or, or move in response to the motion of the, the mirrors. And it was a really incredible, beautiful experience and also interweaving these different publics that haven't connected regularly with the Carpenter Center. Um, and again, giving them something at stake in the kind of activity that is helping to build the publics. And, um, and then the last project is just a little sneak peek at um, a part of a course that I'll teach this, this spring. Um, Phil Collins, a learning site that will look at his 
practice through the lens of context, audience, and, um, and institution, and where the students also will, will invert the kind of conversations that are had in public to create a public program and essentially to sort of dissect his practice over the course of an entire term. But also it becomes part of the programming at the Carpenter Center um, as part of a class I'm teaching in contemporary art and curatorial practice. So that's very quick, but I hope it engenders some questions after this, so thank you. Hello everyone. Um, Thank you, Ruth, Carol, and Jim for three uh, very rich and multi-layered presentations. I have been furiously scribbling notes and my job here is to open up with, um, I think I'm gonna open up with a, an observation that could potentially form a question and then open it up to the floor uh, given that we're a little bit tight on time today. Um, there were so many points of convergence in your talks, very, very productive points of convergence that I think resonate with some of the discussions that we had in the first panel. And if I were to boil it down to one thing, there are multiple things, but one thing that really struck me that connected all of your talks is a concern with curatorial responsibility and ethics. And there are three terms that I'd like to draw out of your talks that each resonated very strongly with that concept. And so the first um, would be what Ruth referred to via this wonderful quote by John Cage is lagging. And um, you know, in the, especially with the history of Black Mountain College, art history, museum culture have been shockingly lagging in giving the public a full-fledged presentation of this period in history. This has been a really long time before we've had uh, until we've had, and we have this flourishing body of scholarship, Eva Diaz's work, the, the exhibition here, of course, it should be mentioned that there was a completely separate show that I think has now closed in Berlin at the Hamburger Bahnhof that took place this past summer, which I was lucky enough to see, um, which looked very, very different from the current show. But the opportunity to see both of these exhibitions was really uh, personally fantastic. I've only seen the show briefly last night once, and I need to go back and spend a lot more time. But I'm interested in this idea of how do we deal with that lag, that historical lag. And of course, Cage was talking about a much shorter term lag, that music could lag behind painting in this uh, very brief moment in 1952. The other, uh, the next term that I was really interested in was fixing um, this uh, reference to Michael Ned Holty's work. and this problem of um, acknowledging the importance of the work, but especially in the context of Black Mountain College, what we in many ways I think have to acknowledge is the aura of the work. I, I really found myself in this exhibition last night and in the Berlin show dealing with very intense feelings of longing for a social situation, a, uh, a collaborative type of community, that existed at a particular moment in history that we really don't quite have access to any longer, but also in a very kind of base material sense that there are so many things in the show, I, I literally felt like I coveted, I wanted to take them home. And this sense of these objects sort of being fixed in time and space and history, but also the side of the, the exhibition and the shows that you've been working on, um, the historical projects that you've revived, how they, um, how you've negotiated this issue of things getting fixed in place physically, um, mentally, et cetera. And then Jim's idea of the scene that you want to create at Harvard, but the scenes you've been attempting to create. And I wonder if we can open that up to a larger discussion about boundaries between historical moments. In other words, can we consider people who are no longer alive to be part of a scene that we instantiate today and this porousness, you kept talking about porousness, I think it's another very relevant term. Um, I think we can think about porousness in terms of historicity and the porousness between uh, periods in time and through these processes of historical recreation, reinvention, reactivation, how can we make that porousness visible and experienced, uh, all of which, for, to me, comes down to questions of ethics and curatorial responsibility. 
Those aren't really questions. <laughs> Those are more thoughts. But if you, any of you would like to expand on them, or we could just open up questions from the floor. I would be willing to expand, but I could use another mic. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a it's a story, uh, a quick story to be told about the process of working with Steve Roden and his curatorial team, and. Um, a decision that they made as they were going through the material, and it was um, uh, hinted at in one of the quotes that I read, but we had a very particular discussion as we moved towards the presentation because I wanted to talk with them about documentation. Hmm. And they said, we've made, we've made a decision. We don't want it videoed. We, we don't want any video documentation. And of course, my initial reaction was one of, well, what do you mean? That's one of the ways we tell the story. And he was very um, direct and just said, the problem is, and again, this relates back to Michael's quote as well, mm -hmm. is the time-based document will give too much credibility to that particular instantiation of whatever gets circulated. Mm -hmm. And in fact, part of what made this such a remarkable and life-changing process and project for us was the fact that it was so open and that there wasn't a sense of the way this is done. Mm -hmm. So we feel it is our responsibility not to take our own moments that seriously to kind of circulate them that way because it would be at the cost of the next group of being able to mount their own investigation investigation. Mm -hmm. um, and I was convinced. Yeah, after all these conversations about what we're missing from Black Mountain College, yeah. and for you to make a decision in the present yeah. and, and accept this idea not to, not to want to record something for posterity, it's a, it's a difficult dilemma, I suppose. Yeah. I think the uh, the terms lagging and lagging and fixing also uh, make me think of sort of the recuperation mm -hmm. and the challenge that a sort of recuperation of some of these figures um, like MC Richards or some of the many names that are in the exhibition that were unknown to me before starting on this project like Osip Zadkin and Mary Callery um, and a number of artists and I guess the sort of I think that the the challenge with, with the project um, as large an exhibition as Leap Before You Look this 400 page book we made like the the I think the, the difficulty in a project like that is how you can suggest on the one hand a sort of serious scholarly and historical mm -hmm. endeavor that was really um, attempted at a kind of exhaustiveness of archival resources while retaining spaces that it doesn't fix that history yeah. but rather it sort of becomes the starting point to introducing some of these figures for really the work to begin now yeah. and I feel like yeah. when, when we finished the exhibition on one late one Thursday night, Helen and I stood there and we said, you know, more, the best thing that could come from the show is a hundred more. And I think mm -hmm. that there's this sort of challenge on the part of the institution to want to put forward a sense of, of finish and like, here's the big show. Um, but I think that the best thing that one can do in attempting to recuperate any sort of lag is to not fix that history and to sort of open it up to to the voices, and I feel like that's what this this conference and other conferences, as well as the many authors that participate in the catalog, sort of are doing. How how are you documenting the more ephemeral performance-based events? iPhones. <laughs> so there's no. It was a really we had a small budget for the theater okay. piece uh, number one times fifty project, and uh, as anybody who's participating who's in this room knows, so we are um, doing self-documentation. Mm -hmm. Lots of the artists are bringing in friends who are also videographers and photographers. Yeah. Um, some of them will be. We might have a couple more professional documentation, but um, that's, the, that's the idea. I want to just jump in to ask Jim to talk a bit about documentation, but on a project you didn't show us today, which um, you worked with um, Christoph Wodischko uh, to animate the, the um, Harvard statue in Harvard Yard. And in, in Wodischko speaking about that piece and about, about issues of documentation, but different ones, which is um, the reality of our social media moment, of the students that chose to participate in that project and share their thoughts, um, needed to understand um, the lack of control that would, would then happen because of so many people choosing to capture their own moment. So I don't know whether that's of interest to you to discuss, but I found that project you did deeply compelling for that reason. 
Well, I think the, I mean, the documentation for that or for the institution or for the activity with Bureau of Open Culture, it's it's the narrative, right, that you that you are scripting to in order to be able to communicate about the project in the future. And so his, I mean, Wodzicka's project, that, that's his own narrative that he's either choosing to leave out some of the comments that the students had made about their response to being students at Harvard or not. I mean, documentation for me and for my practice is really very important, I think, because with Bureau for Open Culture, for instance, I mean, you, I actually am in t attuned to the kind of narrative that can be constructed for a project before it's even finished and understanding the different kinds of angles that need to be taken both uh, like photographically and film. And so how does this project, uh, a project for instance, fit into a larger narrative about the history of maybe my time at the Carpenter Center and, and even, but, but being open enough I mean, the activity at the Carpenter Center is a bit of a bumper car situation of evaluating it on a kind of constant, critically reflect, reflective mode of activity without anything determined, yet also knowing the narrative that I can construct based on what is there already and in terms of how the institution is evolving. And I think that's where documentation I mean, you've done it with the with the catalog. I mean, it's all it's all about the narrative that you want to pull from it. Great, thanks. I think it's a great point now to open it up to questions from the floor. Can I give you this mic? Thanks. Uh, thank you. I had uh, a chance to hear. Uh, uh, Ruth Erickson talk about the exhibit at the ISA right now, and she, she was talking, and a question we asked her about the decision-making process with the faculty and students, and she recounted a, a thing they had a record of in the archives of a discussion that went from 7 p.m. until 2 in the morning at Black Mountain College, and it was a discussion of whether they were going to desegregate the school, which was illegal at that time to desegregate the school, and the discussion went on because they were worried it might lead to the closing of the school or loss of accreditation or something like that. Um, so since they had to decide things by consensus, Black Mountain College in that moment was revealing that they had a politic, or what uh, Mike Kelly might call a political bone to pick. Uh, but it, all of my years of reading about Black Mountain College, I never knew that that was a, a dynamic that was going on, that they had that anti-racism element. And I'm just wondering if under the system of white supremacy, it's required for the curatorial practice of uh, museum curators, and especially exhibits that involve the public dollar, to, uh, to erase anti-racism tendencies or, or overt uh, politics in the, the uh, artists that are represented. I just think of the number of exhibitions related and spinning out from that, Alan Capro, the anti-war stuff, those things were deeply political, but as, I, as a young art student was learning art history, that stuff was made invisible to me and I had to learn it, about it much later. That's a difficult Anyone question. want to take that one on? <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. I mean, I think there's many ways to think about how those politics um, are made visible, and I think that one of the the tasks of a of a um, of a curator and the ethics really of curatorial practice are how can we um, put together pairings and create environments and sets of objects that can sort of provoke in individuals and visitors uh, questions about politics, about racism, about sexism, about many of the sort of um, systems and ills under, you know, with which we still work and how can we kind of provoke that kind of active questioning within visitors. But of course the idea that that's going to work with every visitor who have come in with very different experiences and sets of uh, ideas and education about what they're seeing uh, is one of the greatest challenges. But yeah, I mean that, um, 
the, for us, the exhibition was uh, not as easy a place to get into the questions of integration uh, at Black Mountain College, and we do address it uh, better in the book, and then by including some of the sort of figures that were there, like Roland Hayes and Jacob Lawrence, um, but it's not something that we were able to really figure out how to put out front through the set of art objects that we have in there, though I think the performances and passing time, Jonathan Calm's performance is very much about racism uh, at Black Mountain College, so that's one way that we're able to sort of think about that in the show. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a great question. Yeah. Any other hands? This is sort of a pickup from that from that question, having to do one of the things that the show told me or informed me about was the fact that this was not an art college, arts college. It was a liberal arts college, and so the arts were integrated into the rest of the curriculum, science, math, humanities in general. And um, this may not be the right session today to bring that up, but I really would love to hear more about the outcomes of that kind of integration into the science curriculum, into the math curriculum, uh, et cetera. And, uh, <laughs> So that, that, again, the arts had, have been totally woven into what the school stood for. Um, and I, don't, I haven't read the catalog, but is there anything in the catalog that, in fact, specifically addresses um, that question? It's really an area where a lot more research needs to be done, and it's just getting started. And actually, the archives uh, in Asheville are starting to assemble the course cards so that we know what are all the other classes that people took. Um, so beyond, you know, Albers and color theory, are what sociology classes and physics class and mathematics classes are some of these other known figures taking. But it's a question that comes up a lot because it's true that the, the artists are kind of what has made Black Mountain College famous, but what were the advances in other fields? And what are the architects and the mathematicians and the social scientists who came out of there, and how did that experience of art sort of shape how they then approach their fields? And it's not something that this project was one of like a million rabbit holes, and we felt like we kept running down them, and it was one that we weren't able to fully tackle, but I really think it's a ripe area of research, and we're actually just, the archives are just organizing themselves so that that kind of work can be done now, um, whereas it really couldn't have been done two years ago. Um, there are individual stories of, you know, Max Dane was this great mathematician there who was a really recognized math mathematician, but he also had this great class, Mathematics for Artists. So to think about somebody like Dorothea Rockburn talks about being very influenced by her work with Max Dane, um, but while she was at Black Mountain College, she was busy having a baby and caring for that child, and she does no work left from her time at Black Mountain College, but we see the after effects of her and Max Dane's relationship, obviously, in, in her art practice. So there's little stories like that, but again, that's bringing it back to the artists, not necessarily to the other fields. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a gap. There's a question in the back. While you're running with the microphone, I'll just, um, I think there's also a potential for Jim to respond to sort of a combined version of those two questions, which might have to do with this relationship between self-governance that came up uh, last night, and it's come up today a little bit, uh, and pedagogy. And I wonder if you can say just briefly, before we take the question, what um, your own, how you see the Carpenter Center working within that context of a, of a liberal arts institution? Well, I mean, the Carpenter Center is connected to a, a really visionary program, with, with the, which is the Visual Environmental Studies Department, that the Carpenter Center was built to house uh, a department that was founded actually not to um, make a priority on materials, but to combine both intellectual thinking as well as making into one program so that there was a, so it was prioritizing um, discussions about light and color um, equal to other fields of study um, at Harvard. And I think in many ways, I mean, there are people in here that could speak about this better than me, but the VES is a, is a visionary liberal arts program um, in its founding. Um, and so, and that, that legacy still continues to be part of the study there. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I had a question about the recuperation and reconstitution of space um, and the particular space and place of Black Mountain in the context of the exhibition, because I noticed a really um, innovative use of large-scale photography, particularly in the reinvention of the mural that you passed through. Um, and I was curious if you could talk a little bit about the decision to reconstitute what that space and place and moment felt like through the use of photography, and also whether that's going to 
evolve and retranslate when the exhibition travels. So we had scanned at high enough resolution to make those photo, photo murals, about 330 uh, images from the archives, some of which were you know, historical prints that were eight by 10. Um, and so you see on the photo murals, if you've been to the ICA, a lot of scratches and blemishes and the kind of patina of age of the historic document, which was as important for us to retain as it was to use the photo murals to kind of place uh, visitors in the kind of time and space that was rural, uh, that was in the, the first image of these two uh, young ladies walking down from the farm who really places you in the middle of the 40s. It seems like a time long ago. So I think to kind of help visitors think back to the, the space and time, as you said, kind of of Black Mountain College. I don't want to speak on behalf of Helen because it was very much her, um, she always called it, it was her family of man uh, style show that was the not family of man. Um, and you know, very early on she sort of had this idea of these photo murals. Um, I always took it as, as you had suggested of kind of placing back in time. I think I think what it also allows for is uh, a way to get at the kind of social scene and the setting. And you know, mm -hmm. we talked about having uh, p these great pictures of people having meals, and the meals notoriously went on for a long time. And that was Cage said that was actually where the best learning happened was over meals. So being able to kind of get that texture of life um, present in the show in a space mm -hmm. that obviously individual artworks that are framed and guarded can't really sh convey that texture oftentimes. Yeah. Um, so I think that was part of the design. Well. I'm going to take that cue from you about Sorry. meals oh. and um, give you a little housekeeping. We're going to take a break now. But before everyone starts moving around, we will reconvene in about 20 minutes. We'll see what happens. The reason that we designed the room as it was with these round tables was really so that people could have a conversation at lunchtime. We have run a little bit over, so we are going to make lunch a little bit shorter. Um, I would ask, because I know that there's a lot of students that are coming and going, just have lunch if you're going to stay for the afternoon, because we've loved having everyone here, but we want to make sure the people that are staying are able to eat. I'm going to bring a few boxes of um, lunches up front for those people that are here at the front, particularly the Vanderbeeks and the presenters. So you don't have to worry about getting to the back. We will have um, food set up at the back, and we will reconvene in about 20 minutes. I wanted to thank, just give you all an opportunity to thank this wonderful group of conversations. Thank you.